Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> if I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, September 9th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live Steps and, ste- and steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Biden leads in 2020 swing states, while Trump losing some of his base. Meanwhile, looking very much like there will be absolutely no new coronavirus economic relief as states, cities, and workers hit a wall. New report claims that the Sturgis bike rally could be linked to a, a one quarter of a million COVID cases across the country. This as AstraZeneca Zeneca pauses its vaccine trial. Meanwhile, in a shocking and unprecedented move, the Department of Justice He's now representing Donald Trump in his defamation lawsuit stemming from a claim of rape. The Georgia Secretary of State claims 1,000 potential double votes in its primary in a bid to undermine mail-in balloting. Assange's extradition, extradition procedures in its second day Biden is in Michigan today to announce an offshoring plan. Trump to announce troop reduction in Iraq. A Department of Homeland Security draft assessment says that white supremacists are the most lethal lethal threat to the U.S. currently. Day two of the Michigan graduate student strike. And D.C. will pay for high-speed internet for 25,000 people. All this and more on today's program. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. I am in the um, in the Brooklyn studio uh, today. Uh, that's the way it's, it's going to go back and forth for a while. You know, uh, there's a whole host of, uh, of different... Um, whole host of different reasons why we're we're doing it this way and not the least of which has to do with uh, custody issues of uh, both uh, me and uh, my children and uh, of the show uh, so uh, <laughs> um, that's where we are where and it's going to take me a while to get used to switching back and forth and switching that uh, steps and steps and steps at the beginning of the uh, intro and uh, sometimes it's just going to be steps and other days it's, it's steps and steps and steps so uh, there you have that. Um, uh, this we uh, neglected to inform you of yesterday. Over uh, Labor Day weekend, of course, there was a uh, there were boat parades for Donald Trump, and uh, one was on uh, Lake Travis, I believe it is. Right? Uh, is that the name of the lake? Uh, yeah, Travis, Austin. Austin. Yep. Well, the uh, Travis uh, County Sheriff's Office uh, released official information about the boat parade. Uh, this is from a couple of days ago, but I thought you might want to know. Five boats sank. Two were towed. Three, apparently, as of uh, two or three days ago, were still submerged. Most boats that took on water were towed before sinking. Uh, weather was calm. Uh, the problem, of course, is that the large boats generated waves in their wake, and there was no evidence of foul play. Uh, that is, I think, about a best of an encapsulation of of Republicans' perspective on the world that one could get. 
the big boats drive through, they create big wakes, they sink the smaller boats, and then they rely on uh, our tax dollars um, to, to save those folks. There it is. Uh, fortunately, no one was hurt. And, um, but that's, uh, that's, that's what it is right there. I, I mean, terrifying uh, experience, I imagine, for those people. And I'm sorry they went through that. Uh, but that is a, a, a prime example, I think, of the, um, the uh, sort of a perfect metaphor for uh, Republicans, right? I was wondering how the wakes got that big on Lake Travis. Mm -hmm. And the answer is just other big boats. Yes. And <laughs> amazing. Exactly. Well, I would just suggest that those smaller boat owners, you know, pull themselves up by their, I don't know, uh, boat straps and get a bigger <laughs> boat. Um, just a correction uh, that I just got on uh, the IM. Uh, this is an IM I wrote, I read yesterday. Uh, yesterday, I sent in an IM. This is from Jersey Expat. Uh, following an incident in Dobbs Ferry, New York, and promoted an upcoming rally for the Saturday. There's now uh, information that the rally on Saturday is unconfirmed and likely a fake. NBC ran a story on an incident last night. The reporter said the local activists who were interviewed for the piece are planning a rally for this Sunday. The plan to attend this weekend. Please defer to the activists from the NBC piece and not my previous IM. Uh, so there you go. Um, uh, one of today's sponsors is BetterHelp Online Counseling. They are giving our audience 10% off their first month when you go to betterhelp.com slash majority report. Uh, if you're not aware of it, BetterHelp gives you access to your own fully licensed and accredited therapist via phone, chat, or video. Um, as you know, Stressful period of time. A lot of therapists um, elsewhere have long wait lists. It can take weeks or months before they can see you. But when you sign up for better help, they match you with a therapist based upon your specific needs. And you'll be communicating with them in less than 24 hours. Uh, obviously, a lot of people are very uncomfortable with good reason to go into a room with a therapist. Um, also, very difficult to establish a relationship with a the therapist. Um, you know, who are not used to using this type of technology, uh, you know, whatever it is, FaceTime or whatever uh, the, the technology that different uh, therapists are using. Uh, and that's what makes uh, BetterHelp uh, so useful right now. Once BetterHelp uh, connects you with a therapist, if you don't think it's a good fit, you can switch to a new one at any time for any reason, no additional charge. They have thousands of licensed therapists from all over the country. They have therapists with specialties that may not be available in your area that are hard to find. BetterHelp also tends to be more affordable than therapists that you find through traditional means. You don't have to have insurance to use BetterHelp, and they have financial aid options for those who qualify. BetterHelp, giving everyone in our audience 10% off your first month when you go to betterhelp.com slash majority report. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash majority report. Um, so, uh, Donald Trump <clears throat> was down in, uh, Winston, uh, Winston, uh, Winston Salem, North Carolina yesterday. And he apparently has, uh, I want you to just think of, he's in, he's in North Carolina and he is going to restore something to public education. Just want to think about that framing. He's going to restore something. You see what's going on. We will restore patriotic education to our schools. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. Look at you. This is a very sophisticated group, Tom. You know what I'm talking about, patriotic oh. education. Oh. 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 Well, the first thing they do is they want to take your history away. That's a great group behind me. I don't know. They're activists. No, but you know what? You know what it means. They want to take away your history. That's why the monuments and the statues, they want to knock them down. The first thing they do is take away your guts. You know, it's guts. They take away your guts. They take away your statues. They take away your heroes. 
They take away your great generals. They take away your past. Mm. And I said it was going to happen. I said, you know what? They started off with generals and colonels and others that nobody ever heard of. And I thought that was bad. And then they went up a little bit. And I said, you know, someday it's going to be Robert E. Lee. Someday it's going to be Washington. Someday it's going to be Lincoln. Someday it's going to be Jefferson. Someday it's going to be Benjamin Franklin. It's all of them. It's all of them. They take away your past. They're never taking away our past. They're never taking away our past. That's the way they do it. You study it. That's the way they go. They take away your guts. And we'll teach our children to love our country, honor our history, and always respect. There you go. Um, he is, of course, uh, talking about uh, the, it's a, you know, sort of, I guess, a, a question of like Black Lives Matter and the idea of the Confederacy um, and uh, the white supremacy that, that those, those statues promoted. Those statues, all, maybe two, uh, one of them were erected 40, 50 years after the, Civil War, the end of the Civil War. And it was at a time where there was a massive resurgence of the KKK in this country. 1920, there were 6 million card-carrying, self-identified members of the KKK. That's out of 100 million people in the country. 6% self-identifying as KKK in this country. Uh, there was probably more. And uh, even in New York, right? There was like, what, what, what was that big Madison Square Garden um, uh, KKK rally? There was a big march in Washington, D.C. And uh, that's when these statues went up. And it was all part of this myth of the, the lost cause. And so when they talk about patriotism, when Donald Trump is up there talking about patriotism, what he's talking about is white supremacy. How do you, how do you make the argument that it is patriotic to celebrate those people who basically fought against our country. And that's the way you do it. Uh, don't know that that's going to resonate, really. And uh, in a moment, we're going to talk more about um, what Stanley Greenberg found. We've got some uh, polling about swing states that looks pretty good for Biden, though, uh, again, you know, I wouldn't take anything for granted at all. Uh, but Stan Greenberg has a um, interesting uh, reports from a focus group. Uh, before we do, I tell you, uh, as you know, uh, things are challenging enough these days. Seeing a doctor shouldn't be one of those things. That's why you should check out Plush Care. Plush Care provides primary and urgent health care through virtual appointments. Scheduling an appointment, even for the same day, is super easy. You just pick a slot, you book online. With Plush Care, with a Plush Care membership, you can see a doctor from the comfort of your home. You get diagnosed, treated, and even have a prescription sent to your local pharmacy within minutes. You can send unlimited messages to your care team anytime. Plush Care accepts most major insurance carriers, is available in all 50 states, and if you're feeling anxious, depressed, or stressed about what's going on in the world, Plush Care doctors are here to help by discussing treatment options and providing prescriptions as needed. Plush Care makes it easy for you to get the excellent care you need, when you need it, how you need it. They can do the same for, for all of you. Uh, start your membership today. Go to plushcare.com slash majority. You start your free 30-day trial. That's Plush Care, P L. U-S-H-C-A-R-E, plushcare.com slash majority for a free 30-day trial, plushcare.com slash majority. Check that out. Uh, as you know, many people at home more than usual these days, still hard uh, to keep a close eye on things. A lot can happen outside your front doors. A lot can happen on the inside of your doors. Not always free to check on things in person. With Ring, you can keep your home safe no matter where you are. And Ring is on a mission to make neighborhoods in general safer. Ring gives you protection at every corner. Video doorbells let you answer the door and check in on your home anytime. Keep an eye on your doorstep. Speak to delivery people when you can't come to the door. 
With outdoor security cameras, you can check on every part of your house. You never miss a moment. Smart lighting brightens up blind spots and makes sure you always come home to a brightly lit house. They have cameras that are attached to uh, the spotlights, the floodlights, motion detection. And with the all new Ring Video Doorbell 3, you can keep an even closer eye on things than never before. Uh, for me, I got a Ring camera. I've now put in the apartment. I've got two cats in there now. It's a long story. One of them is diabetic, I had to bring in the brother. They were outdoor cats up in the country, and now they're down uh, in the city, and they're lonely and bored. And with uh, a ring uh, camera, I can talk to them, and well, they can't talk back, obviously, but um, they like hearing the sound of my voice. I suppose I could just play the show, but I can actually call them. And I got a buddy who's got a ring camera that is outdoors with a uh, solar panel. And that's the biggest problem you have with outdoor cameras. You can't put them at any distance from your home unless it's wired. Because you use a battery, it runs out. This one has a solar panel uh, adapter to it. Um, great stuff. Check it out. You can get a special offer on the Ring Welcome Kit. When you go to ring.com slash majority, the Welcome Kit includes the Ring Video Doorbell 3 and the Chime Pro. It's all you need to start building custom security for your home today. Just go to ring.com slash majority. That's ring.com slash majority. And you probably heard me talk about Brooklyn and before. They're the homes, uh, the internet's favorite home for sheets. But uh, I have a set of towels and they are amazing. Brooklyn towels give you your daily routines, a little something extra. Uh, you get varying levels of plushness. And the towel of your dreams is ready to wrap you up. And with all this extra time at home, it might be nice to invest in a little extra softness and absorbency. I'll tell you something. For me, honestly, like, you know, there's, uh, there's not as much going on in my life these days. And so uh, I've sort of committed myself to sort of saying like, okay, I'm going to get rid of the ratty uh, old stuff that I have that is just keeping up space. I don't need, I don't, I, I'm, I'm clearing out stuff and I'm just getting stuff that I like. And I'm not getting as much of it. And these Brooklyn and towels are part of that project for me. They are, um, they, they, they feel like I've, I once went to like one of those uh, Palm Spring spas back in the, uh, back in the day. And the towels feel like that. They're soft, but they're not like too, too like mushy. They're perfect. Brooklyn is the perfect place to find all the comforts for home, including these ultra soft towels. They're so confident in their product that everything comes with a lifetime warranty. Use the promo code MAJORITY for 10% off your first order at brooklinen.com. That's brooklinen.com, B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com, promo code MAJORITY. Brooklinen, everything you need to live your most comfortable life. All right, let's, um, oh, that's too bad. We were going to do a uh, random rush today, but Mark Stein is, uh, is filling in for him, so. Time's running out for that. Hey, uh, we mentioned the other day that, uh, yesterday, that uh, the um, Government Oversight Committee, Carol Maloney's, is going to be looking at Louis DeJoy's rise as a Republican fundraiser. And this is coming from, uh, I think it's the Washington Post um, piece. I just want to be clear on what, what he is purported to have done. It is very, very illegal. So this is um, the words of David uh, Young. He was DeJoy's longtime director of human resources at uh, his company, New Breed, uh, from the late 1990s to 2013. So from a federal standpoint, DeJoy is uh, outside the statute of limitations, but he is not outside the statute of limitations in North Carolina. So this is a quote from David Young. Louis was a national fundraiser for the Republican Party. He asked employees for money. We gave him the money. And then he reciprocated by giving us big bonuses. Now, what that means is he has, um, he's reimbursed them and gave them a little kickback. When we got our bonuses, let's just say they were bigger. They exceeded expectations. And that covered the tax and everything else. 
Another former employee with knowledge of the process described a similar series of events, saying DeJoy orchestrated additional compensation for employees who had made political contributions, instructing managers to award bonuses to specific individuals. He would ask employees to make contributions at the same time he would say, I'll get it back to you down the road. According to the former employee, spoke under the condition of anonymity out of fear of retribution from DeJoy. Um, Again, North Carolina does not have statute of limitations. This guy, I don't know if he's going to end up in jail, but he should. Uh, He'll be one of them. He'll be one of them who ends up in jail. I mean, that is presuming, I mean, North Carolina is North Carolina. That's going to happen regardless. And since we're talking about North Carolina, let's talk about Tom Tillis, who is in trouble as it is in his Senate race in North Carolina. And this is going to be relevant because in 2018, the data suggests that to the extent that there were voters who were coming out who weren't just simply voting against Donald Trump, the data suggests that they were coming out because Democrats were talking so much about health care. They weren't necessarily always saying the things that I want them to say. Many of them were. But the bottom line is they were paying attention to health care. You've got two major issues in this country right now. One is economic fears that are shared mainly at this point, anyways, by people in the um, bottom half of the economic of the income distribution in this country. Uh, maybe a little bit higher, but I mean, to a large extent, wealthy people, stock market. People who can work from home, they're doing fine. The other major issue, more or less fine, relatively speaking, the other major issue is health care. And this is going to hurt Tom Tillis, who is already in trouble. This is a clip from the local, I guess, uh, was it Durham? Um W-R-A-L. I'm not sure where they're located in North Carolina. It, it, it features Bev Veals, who is a multi-time cancer survivor. She called Tom Tillis's office to talk about her concerns about health care because her husband had lost his care. And... Um, I don't, I don't think we need to play the whole thing. Let's go through, uh, you know, just to basically when we start to hear from her, okay, Brendan, uh, when they interview her or when we hear the audio. Because I've seen just about everything healthcare has to throw at a person. Over the past 20 years, Bev Veals beat cancer three times, a journey that included struggles to get care and medical bankruptcy. So when her husband was furloughed in March due to COVID, Veals worried about losing her health insurance. I wanted answers because the, the thought of having no health care right now and possibly getting sick with COVID is extremely frightening. She started calling her lawmakers for guidance and came across a Washington, D.C. staffer for Senator Tom Tillis. Frustrated by the lack of empathy, Veals started recording. You're saying that if you can't afford it, you can't afford it, you don't you don't get to have it, and that includes health care. Yeah, just like I want to go to the store and buy a new dress shirt. If I can't afford that dress shirt, I don't get to get it. But health care is something that people need, especially if they have cancer. Well, you got to find a way to get it. To compare it to a dress shirt made me incredibly angry and hurt. So what do I do in the meantime, sir? Sounds like something you have to figure out. WREL Investigates sent Veal's video to Tillis's office and requested an interview with the senator. Instead, we received this statement and an apology to the constituent. Quote, the way Mrs. Veals was talked to by a staff assistant at our Washington office was completely inappropriate and violates the code of conduct Senator Tillis has for his staff, which is why immediate disciplinary action has been taken. The way in which she was talked to? Not the content, not the fact that like, oh, I'm sorry, you're SOL. That way where you elaborate the policy of this country back to your constituents. I mean, just for a moment, I just want to contemplate, like, you know, these staffs, it's not like they've got 45 people working in this office. 
if you're working in that office and you know that you are uh, forward facing to your constituents, that is that attitude that that guy expressed is not is not he's not going rogue here. This isn't something he's developing on his own. This is the attitude that exists in that office. I just think, I mean, contemplate that. It's just stunning. Yeah, he's not in trouble for the way he talked to her. He's in trouble for showing how they really feel about it. Right. You've got to say, like, gosh, the, you know, you blame the Democrats or we can't do anything about it. Or, yeah, no, I know my heart goes out to you. There are charities that you can. Do yeah, there are charities. Them. Not, look, the reality is, is that we perceive healthcare as a consumer product. And if you don't have the money for it, you don't get it. Period. End of story. And I can understand that you're upset. You've got a big problem on your hands because you're a cancer survivor. And you can't afford uh, that shiny new health care that you want so badly. Sorry. That's ultimately, that's fundamentally, right? What the attitude of the Republican Party is. I mean, that is just ideologically where they're at. Ron Paul, uh, I don't know what it was, in 2012, got on that stage and said, you know, if, you're, if you can't afford it, you just die. You die. And that is, at the heart, the, the ideology of Republican perspective on healthcare. Now, a large part of the Democratic Party's perspective is um, we're going to make sure that you get healthcare. It may end up costing you the vast majority of your, your money or a significant portion of your money, but that's just business. But we'll make sure it's available in some fashion or another as long as other people can profit off it. Yeah, you'll get the shirt, but it has to stay with the tags on and the dry cleaning, uh, like plastic covering. You can't really wear it. If you want to wear it, you're going to have to pay a little bit. You definitely deserve the shirt. You just don't deserve it in a fashion that is going to be super easy to get. We're going to put you, we're going to, there's going to be some hoops for you to jump through to get the shirt. The, uh, you know, we may subsidize uh, the shirt a little bit. We'll, we'll work out a couple of different ways in which you can get the shirt. May not be the exact shirt you want. It could be like a knockoff version of that shirt, but you will get a shirt. We are committed to you getting that shirt. It's just that you, know, you got to work with us a little. Some bit. shirts have nicer sh shirts. Some states have nice, nicer shirts than others. That's right. Some have no shirts, but that's just, you know, that's their fault. And, and this is so important because um, of research that Stanley Greenberg has done. There's a focused uh, group that he was looking at. He's a longtime Democratic pollster. Um, and there's a really interesting dynamic, I think, with American politics right now. The, in, in 2018, there was also recently a study by Pew that just came out, actually. I have it right here. Um, the number of voters that came out uh, for the Democrats, obviously uh, higher than, than normal. Um, it was interesting to see who it was that came out in 2018. But the, the bottom line is um, there were really basically two reasons to come out in 2018. And that is, one, you hate Donald Trump. This is, this is the vote for a Democrat. You hate Donald Trump. Or two, and maybe these aren't mutually exclusive, uh, you're pissed about health care. And, and I think to a certain extent, it doesn't go any further than that. There is angst about health care. I mean, certainly there is a, um, a significant chunk. I don't know if it's 25% or 50%, 60%, 70% of the Democratic uh, voter that wants Medicare for all. But as, a, as an entirety, the idea is that you're upset about health care. So Stanley Greenberg has this piece. I think it's in the American Prospect, if I'm not mistaken. And um, he went to a Zoom focus group that was set up by the uh, American Federation of Teachers and Voter Participation Center. And it was outside metropolitan areas in rural Wisconsin in the Mahong Valley uh, region, I'm not saying that correctly, 
Steel Valley uh, in Ohio, in northern Maine, and suburban Macomb County in Michigan, right? So these are big swing areas. And he said it jibes with a phone survey, a survey that he conducted of working class voters in the uh, 16 battleground states right after uh, Kamala Harris was picked. And he said in 2016, a white working class revolt enabled Trump to win men by 48 points and women by 27 points. That margin dipped to 13 points across the entire wor white working class. In a new poll, Trump lost another six points and uh, with white uh, working class women. Biden only trailed Trump by eight points. That's a huge, huge difference. 27 to eight points. Uh, and he, he gets on to talk about, uh, you know, working class, broadly speaking, not just that narrow cohort of white people. Um, a big part of why they voted for Trump in 2016 was so he could end Obamacare and its costly mandate and deliver affordable health insurance for all. When he failed to do so, many voted against the Republican in midterms. He says, uh, but during the pandemic, quote, I have never seen such a poignant discussion of the health and disability problems facing families and their children, the risks they face at work, and the prospect of even higher health care and prescription drug costs. And that's why he said these Zoom focus groups pulled back from Trump. Three quarters of these voters supported Trump in 2016, but less than half plan to vote for him now. If that number holds up in these swing states, Donald Trump is in big trouble. And he said even those who supported him did not push back when the other participants expressed anger with his doing nothing about health care, fostering hatred and racism, dividing the country, and siding with the upper class. Now, again, this is a focus group. It tracks some uh, polling that Greenberg has done. But again, this is just focus group. But they use these focus groups because uh, they tend to, um, to give you a sense of what's going on. However, these same voters are still very cautious about Joe Biden, who seemed old and not very strong, but most importantly offered the prospect of only minor changes to the healthcare system and seemed unlikely to challenge the power of the top 1%. He writes, working class anger with the establishment after the financial crisis of 2008 ran deep into the democratic base of blacks, Hispanics, unmarried women, and millennials too. Many were not initially enthusiastic about the Affordable Care Act in an election after election failed to rally fully for Democratic candidates until the 2018 midterms when Democrats ran on health care, health care, health care. And so his point is this pandemic may allow progressives to battle for working people, regardless of color, by talking about health care. Now, there's a little bit of cynicism here, right? Because the bottom line is you have the Democratic Party certainly helped, but it was not, it was still insufficient in terms of what they did for health care. And Trump could, fill, could step into that void and lie as to his intentions and say, we're going to give you something better. And now you have a situation where Trump is being judged based upon his health care achievements, which are zero, maybe worse. And Biden is going to get the benefit of that, despite the fact that he's not offering anything. But you see, the problem here is, because the, the not offering thing may help him get elected in November. But the problem is going to be in 2022. And the problem is going to be in 2024, unless something actually happens. In today's working class and rural communities, healthcare is everything. He goes through some of the things that everybody like he he was he was shocked by the Zoom uh, uh, focus group. He said, "As I was observing the Zoom group, because they said healthcare, and then everybody had a story. 
He said, as I was observing the Zoom group, I initially wondered whether the focus group recruiter had used some specialized list to find the participants. Maybe like one that was like, have you signed up for more information about healthcare or do, take this survey? Do you hate your healthcare? But he says, then I checked the, the census data on disabilities. 12.6% of the population has disabilities, rising to 15.1% in rural areas. Black and Native American populations are more likely to have disabilities than their white counterparts. The rate is over a quarter for those 65 to 74 years old and over half of those people over 75 years old. Then I looked at the census data he wrote for the congressional districts where the sessions were being hold, held. It's a new window into America in the pandemic. In suburban Macomb County, the disability rate looks like rural areas. In, in Maine, 20% with disabilities. In Ohio 6th Congressional District, 20% for whites and blacks are disabled. Seniors in those areas are even more disabled than other rural Americans. So this is happening across uh, the country. Some of the people when they were talking about um, Joe Biden, the healthcare system is failing them and they want someone to fix it. And Joe Biden's rhetoric has not been very reassuring to make big changes. He's been vague on healthcare. One woman from Wisconsin said, I want to know the specifics of what he'll do to make it better. Now, of course, when they're talking about specifics, they're not saying, you know, we're going to, um, we're going to increase uh, the uh, risk pool uh, benefits for, uh, we're going to increase the number of co-ops or whatever it is. They're looking for broad declarations of that it's going to be easier and cheaper and, and mean it. Will you stop this robbery, I think, is basically yeah. the fundamental sentiment. So you've um, got a lot of people on the nice age. Now, you know, You got people saying to Trump, I supported you in the beginning over Hillary, but in the end, unfortunately, you showed me you're not just for the, you're just not for the people, said one man from Wisconsin. You lied to the American people about COVID, wrote another. You're everything that's wrong with America. You've effectively ruined this country. Congrats, you suck. And he says, it's critical to listen for what they did not say. What they did not say was, what an ass I was to vote for that guy in the last election. They did not regret or say they made a mistake. They have been in financial trouble. They know they they are looking for someone who's going to come in and it starts with paying lip service. But the second time around, it's a function of whether they actually deliver. And so, you know, Joe Biden very well may benefit from the failure of Donald Trump to deal with health care and also to basically tell old people to die in the midst of the covid. Mm. But we're going to have a real problem in 2022, and we're going to have a real problem in 2024 if Joe Biden, if all he's doing is, you know, nibbling around the edges, it is helpful and meaningful to provide health insurance for people living in poverty. But if you want to live, if you want to, if you want to win elections, and you genuinely, and you know, I, I'm taking the most cynical approach on this. I mean, I would hope that these politicians also want to in, decrease the amount of misery that people live in and suffering and stress, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll just stick with elections. If you want to win elections, you're going to have to offer everybody, or at least, you know, the 99%. You're going to have to offer them better options for health care, period, end of story. And that may mean in some instances that unions are pissed up front because increasingly insurance, an offering of insurance is one of the few things that they, they, they can provide. You may, you're obviously going to piss off the insurance industry because you're going to basically you're going to basically destroy it. It's a failed business model as it is. Uh, but this is what needs to happen. 
uh, if the Democrats are going to win and hold power for an extended period of time. And again, that is the, that's the most cynical pitch that I have. Yeah. There's two things I want to share. The first is Obama's uh, county by county 2008 results where he just cleaned up basically all of Wisconsin in a way that obviously Hillary didn't. And then the second is a blog post by Marcy Wheeler. Um, and, you know, everyone talks about the Comey letter having this big effect on Clinton uh, and Trump, but actually the uh, announced Obamacare premium spikes, she argues, had probably had at least as big of an effect, if not a greater effect. Um, and I mean, I just think it's, it's, it's depressing how we've occasionally strayed away from how simple this is. I think for the benefit of the party, I think some of the party leaders, they don't want to talk about how simple Wisconsin would have been one if it was healthcare in 2016. If, if we, if those people weren't still worried about their premiums, whether it's like the depressed black vote in Milwaukee or the rural vote in the rest of Wisconsin, they would have been happy with the Democrats and they weren't. And it wasn't because they all of a sudden became, you know, fascists. And, 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 and I want to make it clear, you know, again, you know, Trump, Trump, won with less votes than Mitt Romney lost. Hmm. And we're going to go into this hard on Friday. Uh, Shahid Buttar is going to join us again. He is running against Nancy Pelosi. Uh, it's going to be this Friday, right, Brendan? Did we lose Brendan? I'm sorry. What's that? I'm, that's uh, Shahid Buttar is going to be here on Friday? That's correct. Okay. And we're going to go in on, uh, on this in terms of Nancy Pelosi. Uh, because when it came time to pass a message bill that is just sitting in the House and doing nothing, and, and it will be completely forgotten. Or maybe it'll be picked up after Joe Biden is president, maybe sometime in February, the HEROES Act. What did they put in there in terms of health care? They said, we're going to subsidize with our tax dollars the single most expensive health care that exists in this country. Dollar for dollar in terms of the care it offers, COBRA is the most expensive uh, health care product existing in terms of health insurance. That's what we're going to do. We're going to finance that. Instead of expanding Medicaid, Instead of expanding Medicare, instead of allowing a Medicare buy, I mean, there's a myriad of different things that they could do, but they are so adamant in not giving an inch because they're afraid that there is a, a moment, there is a critical mass that could be reached where all of a sudden the floodgates open. And these insurance industries, they are lobbying desperately, even if they know the writings on the wall. Look, we see this dynamic. I see this dynamic in, in the context of tort cases. If they're making hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in profits, they're going to stretch it out for as long as they can. If that means six months, that means a year, it means two years, it means three years, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, um, that's what they're going to do. And Nancy Pelosi, it's a message bill. The idea that you're going to, <clears throat> you're going to push Cobra. It's even worse if they actually do something with that bill now. And I would also add <clears throat> that we're looking at no COVID relief for states and cities. It's going to be a disaster. By January, it's going to be a disaster. And she promised, she poo-pooed everybody who said, well, we'll get it, we'll get it. Just, just I, don't know what, I don't know what else to say. Poor strategy, poor tactics, and um, the substance is not very good either. Substance may be worse. Just got an IM from uh, somebody... Milton Apathy. I don't know if I agree completely with Marcy Wheeler on Wisconsin. The targeted ads on social media worked. In uh, 2016, you could literally feel the Facebook ads killing black enthusiasm. I know that may be anecdotal, but I saw it in my circle. But, but the point is, the point is, is that you have the 
opt opportunity to kill black enthusiasm because there's yeah. nothing on the other side. Yeah, right? you pre like, there's pre-propaganda, like basically, right? Like that makes the ground fertile for that. Right. Nothing exists in a vacuum. None of these things are you can you can you can pull out. It's just that there's an opening that's created. And um, and those Facebook ads could run through that opening that was created. And that's, you know, that is the danger, even with this election, you know. Uh, if if we were not in the middle of a pandemic, I would be very, very concerned <laughs> about this race. I'm I'm obviously concerned anyways and stressing, but I'd be really, really worried because um, it's one thing to basically hide out and offer nothing when you've got a guy who's literally out there running on a policy of the old people can die in COVID and everybody else is going to be fine. Here is um, apparently Donald Trump in a newly released recording of an interview with uh, Bob Woodward talking about COVID-19 pandemic on March 19th. Do we have the audio? Oh, gosh. Yes. Let's play this audio. So here's the point. You know, Joe Biden is benefiting from Donald Trump's uh, failure to, to deal with COVID in a, like, sane manner. <laughs> Not even in, like, in a competent manner, like in a sane manner. Um, but down the road, 2022, 2024, we're not going to have that opportunity. Here's Donald Trump talking to a Bob Woodward, apparently on tape. And um, this is in March 19th. They closed down. We went into lockdown, at least in New York, on March, I think it was 16th or 13th. it's turning out it's not just old people bob but just today and, and yesterday some startling facts came out it's not just old old yeah exactly young people to plenty of young people so you, what's going on give in me an, a, a moment of talking to somebody going through this with fauci or somebody who kind of uh it caused a pivot in your mind because it's clear just from what's in on the public record that you went through a pivot on this to, oh my God, the gravity is uh, almost inexplicable and unexplainable. Well, I think, Bob, really, to be honest with you. Sure, I want you to I be. wanted to, uh, I wanted to always play it down. I still like playing it down. Yes, sir. Because I don't want to create a panic. Hmm. What would happen during that panic? Everybody runs for the exits. They stop working. They stop working. He doesn't. And when he says a panic, understand what he's talking about. He's talking they about stop liking me. He's talking oh. about the stock market. He, he we, like the, there is no there is no version of panic that affects the general population. What does that look like? You know, he's worried about panic sell off of the stock market. That's what he's talking about. I wonder if there's just going to be a series of these things that are going to drop. And, and, the, and, the, and the reason why the timing of this is also, um, you know, and, and, and Bob Woodward ha obviously has the audio. He may see it, but, uh, you know, the opportunity, who knows? I hope that there's, uh, there's a little bit more coordination about this, but whatever. Bottom line is now, you know, they don't have a chance to really stay on the, he, he didn't say they were suckers and losers. And that's just going to sit there and marinate in the minds of people who uh, were offended by that. So um, that's going to hurt Donald Trump, too. COVID is, um, is going to be the thing that he just simply can't recover from. And, and, and the fact that there's a, been a complete absence of dealing with health care. And I don't, you know, the Democrats, I... I I, I worry about 2022 if they don't come into office and deal with health care. This should have been something that should have been dealt with the, the past four years or maybe by now. I mean, 
Joe Biden's going to get into office and it's going to be climate change. It's my guess. So you can see voting rights are going to be restored. You're going to see, um, and then you're going to see climate change. And obviously it's a huge urgent need, but people also have a need right now for healthcare. And that has to be addressed. That has to be addressed. Uh, let's uh, let's hear Michael Cohen, who's on Rachel Maddow, and, uh, and then we'll we'll go into the uh, fun half. This is an interesting uh, theory that Michael Cohen has about uh, Donald Trump and what he will do if he loses the election. Um, I don't know if he can get, well, here, let's play this clip. With you, I don't understand it. The president is at least, though, named as individual one in the, in, by prosecutors. And you and your allocution made very clear what you just made here in terms of the fact that this was directed by him for his benefit and you were acting out his wishes. And so he's therefore the most culpable person. You make a point as almost the very last thing you say in the book, which I wanted to ask you about, because I think it may relate to this. President's named as individual one. You went to prison for those felonies. He's clearly the person who directed the commission of those felonies. But you say at the very end of the book that the president and Attorney General William Barr ousted the U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York and tried to install effectively the president's golfing buddy uh, as the new U.S. attorney there because the president, in your view, wanted to arrange for himself to be indicted while he's still in office, because that would give him the opportunity to pardon himself after he lost the election. I just wanted to make sure that I understand the point that you're making there. Just ask you to elaborate on that a little bit, because I'm not sure I understand. Oh, my, my theory is that if he loses, there's still the time between the election and the time that um, the next president would take office. And in during that time, my suspicion is that he will resign as president. He will allow Mike Pence to take over and he will then go ahead and have Mike Pence pardon him. Hmm. And it's a very, let's just say it's a very Nixon type of event. And it was probably discussed between Roger Stone and President Trump at some point that this is certainly one way to avoid any potential prison time. I suppose if he was going to do something like that, he could arrange for the type of pardon that Nixon, in fact, got, where Nixon hadn't been charged with anything. It was a, a prospective pardon um, that he basically arranged from Ford so as to make sure that he'd never be indicted after he left office. I suppose that same sort of arrangement could apply there, even if he wasn't, in fact, yes. charged. So we have to remember that it doesn't apply to state charges, nor does it apply to the charges that will be brought. Yeah. I don't buy it. I think the, I think there is something too. And I think that was my sense uh, at the time as to why uh, Barr wanted to get his guy in at the, um, at the U S attorney's office in the Southern district. They wanted to wrap up a lot of these investigations. I don't know if it was about Trump, but I think they wanted to wrap up a lot of these investigations, get them uh, teed up for a potential pardon that could not be undone at that point. Get them, uh, make a plea deal, wrap up these investigations and so that there's no loose ends for anybody to pursue following Trump. But uh, I don't know. I mean, do you guys think that Matt, that, that Mike Pence would do that? Yeah, it seems, I mean, I think Pence is a good soul, but I think he, I don't know. I think he, he's too much out for Mike Pence at that point. Right, of course. Like what? I think Pence is just like I'm sorry, you know. Like as soon as as soon as Trump loses, Pence is going to be virtually unreachable by phone. I think. <laughs> I think he's just going to be. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. President. I'm really ups I'm, I'm 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 devastated by this. I'm 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 back in Indiana and I'm just trying to nurse my wounds. I can't possibly do this. I I don't I don't buy it. I don't I don't buy it. Um, all right, we're going to take a quick break, head into the fun half of the program. Jamie's going to be joining us, right? She's, is she, do we have her? Uh, uh, just no, a reminder, yeah, yeah. 
This program relies on your support. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you support the free show. And then we'll give you extra content virtually every single day. Also, don't forget, um, when do we get the pencils coming, Brendan? Well, we just approved uh, final designs the other day, and uh, they should be online in the next few weeks. This is Brendan talking to me like I'm seven. <laughs> Do you remember two days ago when you looked at the final design? So they can't, they're not, it's not. I didn't want it. I, didn't, I just didn't they're want not, pencils to go up that weren't up to, you know, the majority report standards. Because I feel like that would have been worse than, you know, making sure we had things just exactly perfect. That's right. Pencils aren't made out of magic, Sam. We don't have a, now they have to be printed. So. Uh, but if you go to uh, shop.majorityreportradio.com, you will see that we have merchandise that is in there. People are loving it. We got, do we have positive stuff yet on the t-shirts or is that coming out in the next wave? That's part of the, the next big uh, merch drop. No, I think I just blew it, right? Wow. Also, don't forget justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority, get 10% off. And I just looked at the AMQ numbers this morning. Uh, AM Quickie. Thousands upon thousands of you listen to the AM Quickie every morning. I didn't check uh, what's happening on uh, the YouTube when we play it on YouTube or Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, but just as a podcast, thousands upon thousands of you. And I want there to be thousands upon thousands of you more listening to AM Quickie every morning, six or seven minutes, sometimes eight, it depends. It just gives you a sense of what the news is going to be that day. So stories that, um, you won't hear from other places. Talk about the top stories, but then you talk about stories that you'll miss. Good corrective for your uh, whatever it is, whatever your AM talk radio, uh, you know, top of the news uh, things that you're listening to. Uh, so check it out, amquickie.com, or you just find it on, I don't know, Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify or wherever it is. Uh, so check that out. Uh, also, don't forget, the Nomiki Show. It's on right after this one at 3 p.m. You can go to youtube.com slash the Nomiki Show. Uh, also, patreon.com. Wait, did she start this week? It's this week, right? Tuesday through Friday. Started yesterday. 3 p.m. Yeah. That's right. Uh, check it out. I, I don't even remember that yesterday was Tuesday. But I'm like, that's where I'm at right now. Um, Jamie, what's happening on the Antifada? Hello. So this week on the Antifada, Sean and, jo Sean and Andy speak with the great Brace Belden from Truanon to talk about uh, union power and labor organizing past, present and future. Um, they talk about how communist organizers like Harry Bridges, leader of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, exercise this kind of power in the past and how we can fight to bring it back today. Um, and they end on a call to build a workers party, a vanguard party, a not necessarily electoral party, the thing that is the million dollar question for the organized left right now. Um, and then on Friday, that's out now. And then on Friday, we've got a bonus episode coming out where Sean and Brace talk about music and life as young punks. And that is all to be found at patreon.com slash the Antifada. Also, I should mention... Uh, I'm going on the Nomi Key show tomorrow to talk about socialist feminism. At least I, I, I believe that I am. <laughs> That's like a, um, it's like a crossover episode. You could say that. Yeah. So, yeah. Jetsons meet the Flintstones. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. What is that supposed to mean? What do you mean? That's that's about the most famous question? crossover. Oh, well, I didn't mean I did. We didn't mean it like that. I just oh, wow. it. those are <laughs> beloved Hanna Barbera characters. I mean, it's more. I think it's more like uh, you know, I don't know, like um, the Jeffersons meets um, All in the Family or something like that. Although, actually, that's a spin off <laughs> situation. The Jeffersons were actually spun off from All in the Family. You guys don't even know what I'm talking about. So mine was more correct. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. I'll, uh, I'll ask Nomi what uh, beloved TV shows she would like to compare the crossover to. <laughs> Matt, 
what uh, what's happening on TMBS this week and um, and also Literary Hangover? Yeah, last night on TMBS we talked to Milton Alamadi about the pointless coup in uh, or Milton Alamadi about the pointless coup in Mali, uh, Museveni in Uganda. Uh, we also talked about J.P. Morgan admits some unethical behavior, and uh, Lula returns uh, with some fiery speeches, uh, and also. Uh, so that's patreon.com slash TMBS and uh, on YouTube. On Literary Hangover over the weekend, I took to the skies in Microsoft Flight Simulator and uh, gave people a tour of the Bismarck Mandan area. We saw where, the, for instance, the Dakota Access Pipeline crossed south of town. And uh, um, yeah, so check that out. I'm going to be doing a lot of Flight Simulator because I'm addicted to You have to a game. clip of that? You should, I would love to see a clip of that. You should bring I, that You should bring that on the show. We should play like a, like a two-minute, like not a two-minute, but like a minute clip. I'd like to see that. Yeah, I could I, I could play it, um, but not right now, I guess. I, I, no, I still have it. Yeah, I can play it. I can pull it up right now. All right. Here, uh, I'll share it. I'm um, sort of interested in seeing this. Um, here it is. Maybe this is but, a FNAF thing. Let's skip here. So yeah, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So this is me over flying over my hometown. We can't see it. <laughs> oh, you can't see it. Oh, no, oh really? Uh, oh, there water we go. access here. Wow. <laughs> then, that, that, that's pretty. To the left down here. Jeez. It's photorealistic. Wow. Yeah. As long as I remember. Video wait, games wait, have really that, progressed that since I that, last played them. Wait, wait, what's that? That water stuff over there, like Missouri, right? Um, uh, yeah, that's the Missouri River, and oh, there's wait, some. Uh, these wait, are man-made inlets. Oh wow! Yeah. I've never seen anything like that. Those man-made yep. inlets. That's where the uh, the new money uh, goes to make giant. Like, like a little golf community, except for it's boating, right? And so we're just we're gonna. They, I mean, can they do that? Well, I guess they can. It's just, yeah. To make. It's making me a little boaters. more worried about the boaters, the beautiful squares boaters. There. <laughs> what about the squares of water? Uh, I'm not sure what those are. I think maybe water treatment or something. Oh, that's uh, nice. That's yeah, nice. and uh, we go south of town to uh, to go to Access Pipeline. Um, so yeah, I give people the full tour. So uh, yeah, t- uh, twitch.tv slash literary hangover if you want to watch me play Flight Simulator. Cool. There's a lot more going the, uh... on. A little of that Arcade Fire album that came out like 10 years ago where it comes with uh, like a, a game where you put in your childhood address and you're like running around your old neighborhood. I remember that. Yeah, the suburbs. It was really uh, cutting edge at the time, that technology. <laughs> yeah. I really missed that. Surprise. Uh, All right, folks. See you in the fun half. 646-257-3920. You are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun. Are you ready? What, who sent us this? Alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy, back. And the alpha males are back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just want to degrade the white man. The alpha males are back, back. I take all of it in my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Almost says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back. I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Danner song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks, what's your mind? I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Almost says what? What 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 what
Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are back. There doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. You can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck them! Fuck them! Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. All right, we're back. It is the uh, fun half of the uh, majority report. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, back to the program. Let's deal with this stuff coming out of Georgia right now, because this, in many respects, I think is um, is really impo- important to to push back upon, because um, one of the things that um, I'm very concerned about is what's going to happen on election day and the following week or two. Uh, It's conceivable that, well, let's just go through the scenarios that are, uh, that we know are impossible first. Donald Trump will not win more votes than, than Joe Biden in the country. That's not going to happen. The, uh, the next thing that is unlikely to happen though it's possible, is that Joe Biden wins uh, that many more votes on the day of the election uh, than than Donald Trump in states like Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, and Florida, let's say, maybe Ohio, maybe Arizona, whatever, uh, that the election is able to be called that night. I think that's also highly unlikely. Not as unlikely as Donald Trump getting more votes, broadly speaking. It's also possible that Donald Trump gets more votes at the end of the day in, the, in, in, in those swing states and Donald Trump wins the election. But what I think is the most likely scenario is that we don't know who won at, uh, you know, in the early a.m. of November 4th. And in the days following that, there's an opportunity for a lot of turmoil. And, and what the Trump campaign and the Republicans are trying to do right now is set the predicate that vote by mail is unreliable and that it is fraudulent in, you know, prima facie fraudulent. And I think that's what's going on here in Georgia. The, um, in Georgia, the secretary of state has claimed, and what there was, there, you know, there were, there were thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of uh, vote by mail votes. But you remember, Georgia was a crap show. And the secretary, uh, Georgia Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, he's a Republican, he announced at a press conference that a thousand Georgians voted twice in the state's June 9th uh, primary, a felony that will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law, he said. And these claims are, I think, highly dubious. There were 1.15, maybe 1.2 million uh, absentee ballots that were um, cast in Georgia in that primary. And that's less than 1%. No, excuse me. It's less than 0.01%. 1,000 votes. But of course, we don't want any double votes anywhere. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, 1,000 people wouldn't have made the difference in any of the states, but, you know, you get up to 10,000, 11,000, 10, 12 times that. But um, according to this Georgia Secretary of State, this was done on purpose as a way of cheating. 
But in Georgia, it is not illegal to show up at a uh, polling place after you've requested an absentee ballot. It was about 100,000, 150,000 Georgians who did so because they were afraid that maybe their ballot wasn't counted, they were, didn't get it, whatever it is. The, uh, the ballot system records that they've asked for an absentee ballot. And the ballot, the absentee ballot can be canceled at that point because people are, you know, I did an absentee ballot. It turns out I'm in town and I want to vote because I'm afraid that my vote's not going to be counted. Um, apparently, apparently in some instances, the election workers may not have ca effectively canceled that absentee ballot. You know, people put in typos, people, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the implication that a thousand people were trying to do something fraudulent, and, and incidentally, it worked for 149,000 right off the bat. And obviously they found this other 1,000 people. And so, and this is on top of the fact that the Georgia election, uh, you know, the entire system was a complete disaster on that day. So the point being that it's quite possible there was a couple hundred people who voted and not necessarily in a fraudulent manner, just in one which they thought that their, their second vote would not be canceled because the, the process worked for 149,000 people. So it's very hard to believe that there was a thousand people who came with the intent of fraudulently voting twice and managed to sneak through. Um, but this is going to be used as I guarantee you, Donald Trump will be using this on the campaign trail today if he hasn't already said it. Tomorrow, you're going to hear Bill Barr go on, I don't know, whatever uh, TV show it is and repeat this. And you got to be clear on this. There's a great piece that um, Judd Legum did on popular, uh, is it popular info, Brandon? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, check that out. Um, but here is uh, Fox and Friends going on and basically doing what exactly what the Georgia State Secretary was hoping to do. That is to create this sense that there is a problem with mail-in balloting when in fact, no, there's a problem in some instances with some uh, poll workers in Georgia. Oh. And they're going out and they're uh, all across the country. People are the secretaries of state are suggesting ask for your mail in ballot early and try to get it in early as well. And so far, the numbers are more Democrats are asking than Republicans. Yep. And maybe that's something to do with the president worried about people getting unsolicited requests when they just show up in your mailbox. Well, this confuses just out, people. And this just out this morning in Georgia, they got the numbers back from the primaries. People voted two times in that state. One thousand people voted two times in that state. Fifty eight percent of them were Democrats. Well, yeah, that makes your soul feel a lot better, doesn't it? Well, you got to wonder, Brian, to your point about more Democrats have requested mail-in ballots. That would suggest that more Republicans, perhaps, are going to show up at the actual polls to see their votes count on Election Day, rather than right. wait for somebody in the back room to count them up. Which makes you worry about that so-called red mirage, where one person wins on Election Day, and gradually they lose. You've been watching too much cable news. <laughs> there you go. The red mirage, right? They're, they're already starting the narrative. Now, incidentally, if 58% of them voted Democrat and 42% uh, of them voted uh, Republican, we're talking uh, a, a swing of, of literally um, 160 votes out of 150,000, out of, um, excuse me, 1.2 million people who voted by mail, 160 votes. And incidentally, they caught them. And that is just presuming that this is not a function of, of typos as they data entry, that they failed to cancel those ballots. 150, again, 150,000 people showed up at the uh, polling places after uh, requesting and sending in an absentee ballot. And they effectively 
canceled those ballots because you're allowed to do that in Georgia. You show up, I cancel my absentee ballot, I vote now. 149,000 people did that uh, without any issue whatsoever. 1,000 uh, supposedly, according to the Secretary of State from Georgia, did it fraudulently, but it's far more likely that there was clerical errors that they ultimately caught. And again, the difference was 180 votes, 160 votes, 160, not 160,000, 160 out of millions of people who voted in Georgia in that election. So very important yeah. to keep this straight. If anything, it seems like the system is working surprisingly well. Exactly. Exactly. Like, I don't know if we could get those, uh, those numbers in New York City. Maybe they uh, do a better job in Georgia, but like, what? We have a harder, we have a, 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 a higher failure rate in just recording, um, you know, people who sign up to be members and, uh, you know, and I got news for you. We don't have 150,000 or 1.2 million or any of that. Uh, none of those numbers apply. Um, but uh, let's not be negative, Jamie, for a moment. Let's take a moment and celebrate the fact that um, Donald Trump has been uh, nominated. Has he been nominated? Officially nominated? Yes. He's been yes. nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And um, which one should we play first? Would you play the Fox and Friends clip and then the, uh, the, the tweet? The, the news one sets it up and then we get the yeah. reaction. Okay. So which one? The, oh, Three, the, then four. Yeah. Okay. Play three. House with the breaking developments. This just came down right before our show, Jillian. That's right. A bit of breaking news for you this morning, Ainsley. So a single source has told Fox News Radio that for the second time in three years, they have nominated President Trump for a Nobel Peace Prize. This time it is for 2021. This is a preliminary step in the nominating process. It does not mean that President Trump is going to ultimately win that Peace Prize. Now, the individual uh, is a Norwegian member of parliament. His name's Christian Tybring Jetty, and he tells Fox News he has again submitted a formal letter to the prize committee for consideration. He has also given Fox News a copy of the letter. This time, he says it's based on President Trump's brokering of a deal between Israel and the UAE. Jetty says he believes this president has done more trying to create peace than most other Peace Prize nominees. Take a listen. You don't ask for the personality of the people, you just ask the performance of the people. And Donald J. Trump has performed very well internationally. What he does in internally domestically is uh, it's not, a, it's not a, the price of peace price matter. It's actually what you achieve in international diplomatics. And, and Donald J. Trump has proven that he is worthy the Nobel Peace Prize. The Peace Prize is a nomination that President Trump has talked about in the past. Yesterday, he touted his own efforts at peace a couple of times. Take a listen. Achieved the first breakthrough in the Middle East peace for many, many decades, decades. Even the New York Times said that was an amazing achievement. Do you believe that? I said, let me see that one. No, we did something that nobody thought was possible. Now, the White House and the Norwegian Nobel Institute have yet to confirm this nomination. We're working to get it. If we do, Brian Ainsley, Steve, we will, of course, get that to you right away. So uh, just to be clear, the news is that there's a rumor that a right wing member of Norway's parliament. And uh, apparently in the uh, any member of the National Assembly in Norway can nominate someone for a peace prize, including others. He has uh, he is known for repeatedly expressing Islamophobic and anti-immigration views over the years. Yeah, it's <laughs> in the Muslim? first sentence of his Wikipedia page. Is that? He, yeah, I mean, I, if you trust Wikipedia to be an unbiased source, which not everybody does. That's right. He claimed that Muslims were driving cultural Norwegians out of Oslo neighborhoods and that Muslims should take a vow to uh, their Christian state. Um and uh, you should know that there was last year, there were 318 candidates uh, for the 2020 uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Um, so, you know, he's in he's in good company, I guess, uh, Donald Trump there. And also that Israel UAE deal. 
that was basically a deal that they had struck. They have had unofficially for years. And it's really uh, all about uh, essentially launching a uh, united front against Iran. So not necessarily the, the greatest peaceful um, achievement in the history of the world, but uh, probably maybe, maybe worth a nomination for whatever that's worth. Here is a Fox and Friends just gushing over that. Again, it, like, you know, they heard it and they're just, they're super excited about this now. John Decker, congratulations. He's going to be talking to the president a little bit later on for Fox News Radio. Uh, so that's great to him. Um, so the guy, I love the fact that the, the person who nominated President Trump, uh, Ty Brig uh, Jadi, yeah. I'm not sure Norwegian if they're any Norwegians, uh, how many Norwegians we have on staff, but I'm not sure if the G or J I'm is Swedish. silent. Yeah. Steve, is it the G or J that's silent? <laughs> I think it's Jetty. Okay. Uh, let's say Jetty. Same uh, guy who nominated him a few years ago. Look at that. They've ago. already got right. the graphic he up. Says, uh, right. He says, I'm not a Trump supporter, but the committee should look at the facts and judge on the facts. Uh, the people that have received this Peace Prize in recent years have done much less than Donald Trump. And for example, Barack Obama did nothing. So a bit of a shot for somebody who really doesn't understand the political system here. Well, anyway, uh, nonetheless, the president was ah, nominated for another so one. Happy. Let's see what happens. It's great news for the country. Well, and we'll, we'll see whether or not uh, the uh, committee winds up uh, bestowing it upon the president or if, just like last time, they do not give it to well, him. Well, and just like it was great when, when uh, President Obama got it for our country. There it you is go. good for our country. Right. right Although right. this president actually has an accomplishment, unlike uh, Barack Obama, <laughs> uh, who got it after nine months of, as we heard from uh, Colonel Walsh, who, Walsh, who uh, was on our program about a half an hour ago, he got it for simply breathing. All right. There you go. Obama got That's it. a callback to their, their golden era. <laughs> That's right. Um, the, the, uh, Obama should have gotten it maybe for the Iran deal, uh, frankly, which, of course, uh, Donald Trump has uh, destroyed. That may cut against it. Can you, can you get a peace? Can you get a peace prize based upon a, uh, an agreement about peace that is basically just uh, made official for the sake of creating uh, more like hostility and particularly against a country that was, had basically come into the fold, uh, the international fold on some level. Um, I mean, does it, Lindy. does it Kissinger have a peace prize? Like there yeah. are no real criteria. Let's not get it twisted. Yeah. I think that's, uh, I think that's fair. Um, meanwhile, the DOJ announced that it will be representing Donald Trump. This is fairly, um, well, no, this is unprecedented, frankly. Um, and it may be found um, okay by the courts because of the nature of our courts at this time. But on Tuesday, the Justice Department basically replaced Donald Trump's l private legal team with government lawyers to defend him against a defamation lawsuit that Gene Carroll um, has filed against the president. She, you'll recall, accused him of raping her, and I think it was Macy's uh, in the 1990s in a, uh, a dressing room. I don't know if it was Macy's or some other department store. I can't remember. Um, Donald Trump said that he uh, didn't, and he uh, said that she was crazy and denied that he even knew her. And so she filed a defamation lawsuit because you can't, um, well, I think maybe there it could be a statute of limitations in terms of the rape and, and, and certainly the, um, uh, the, the president can't be tried for uh, criminal activity as we've now come to understand. So the argument is that a federal law gives government immunity from uh, defamation, uh, defamation lawsuits if you're an employee of the federal government. Uh, but it's unclear that the president is an employee of the federal government. It doesn't work for an agency. The law specifically says, so there's two, there's two, there's two things that you need. Um, are you an employee of the United States? And totally. were you acting as that, were you acting in that capacity 
when you committed the act that you're being sued for. So um, is the president an employee of the United States? A. B. Was he acting as in that capacity as president when he denied that he raped Carol? And I, I think it's fairly obvious that there's nothing, no requirement of being a president that uh, that requires you to deny that you raped somebody uh, and defame somebody. He was defending the country against haters. They don't want bad. It would be bad for America if the if their president was found out to be a rapist. So I pretend like I'm not. There's also uh, the the statute says defines employees as officers or employees of any federal agency. And then the question becomes, is the presidency a federal agency or is it simply a very unique position? I would argue the latter, but uh, who knows with this? Um, there's apparently a, um, a case care versus Bellinger. Bellinger, I think was a uh, Congressman care was uh, suing them. Uh, but, that case may have been decided in a way that the DOJ will be able to do this, but it's also Donald Trump running out of money and wanting to, to offload the government, the expense of his uh, private legal defense to the government. What would be really good is if this uh, case stretched out for a while and uh, Donald Trump lost the presidency and then Joe Biden appointed his own, uh, his own uh, head of the DOJ and they uh, did not do a great job on this case. That would be fun, but we'll see. Let's go to the uh, phones. Calling from a eight one, eight, excuse me, eight zero one. Um, hey Sam, this is Kyle from Salt Lake City. Kyle from Salt Lake City. What's happening, Kyle? Well, um, I was going to call ye yesterday morning. Um, so I'm sure you've seen like the insane smoke just everywhere on the western part of the United States. I think Ronald Reagan uh, yep. mentioned something about his family in Oregon, and it's just like super apocalyptic. So we actually had some of that smoke here. Um, it was like 100 degrees over the weekend, but we actually ended up getting um, some sort of like Arctic storm that moved in and um, hit us. Yesterday, we had snow and knocked out about uh, 200,000 people's power here in Salt Lake, which is also the same day that uh, Salt Lake School District was um, starting starting school again with <laughs> with students. So um, so that was a fun little wrinkle that was tossed upon everything else that's just layering up right now. So um, most like tons of people still don't have power. They said for probably 100 to 150 thousand people, um, it's going to be a multi uh, day outage event that's happening here right now. Wow. So that's something that's going on. Um, but what I really wanted to call about um, something that happened. Uh, last week that's gaining some traction, um, even internationally, I saw, was that um, cops shot a 13-year-old autistic boy yeah. um, last week here. I don't know if this is something that you heard about, but... Um, I did. Um, so basically... Go ahead. Yeah. I, yeah. So basically what happened was, um, and this is a, a white kid, which... Um, theoretically makes a difference for how some people, especially in this area, respond to this type of thing. But um, what happened was, is that this, he, he has Asperger's and he was having a mental episode and his mother, she called 911. And we should and be clear. Let me just try to reach. Let the, me just fill in a detail yeah. here. He apparently has a, a lot of problems with uh, separation and she was yeah. going to work for the first time in months and months. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she so he was he was having a really hard time having a mental episode and she called specifically asking for the crisis intervention team said specifically her son wasn't armed or violent or anything like that. And the next thing you know, um, he was shot quote several times and he's currently in critical condition. Um, and I just don't think there's a much better example of like you know, where this defund the police conversation really needs to go to and like what we, what people mean when they say that, because there, there just aren't, I mean, every single I issue that was present in this, like basically led to this happening. And there just weren't the people that should be responding to this situation, responding to the situation. Instead, it was 
violent police officers who, and, and we still don't know exactly what happened, but like the mom is asking a lot of questions as she should be. And, and so is everyone else. But like, how does something like this end with a 13 year old boy who is definitely not dangerous, especially to police officers end with him getting shot multiple times and thank God he's alive still, but he's in critical condition. Yep. And then now obviously um, the the hospital bills and all that and the recovery and the mom, like he said, the mom was going back to work for the first time in a long time. Yep. Um, luckily there's a lot of community support around that, but like, I, like, I don't even know what else you can say about this. Like how, how do people not see that there's just a gigantic issue um, well, in this, in that there was, there was, you know, I just saw a study the other day that showed that, um, you know, again, and I think, you know, we, we talked about this, uh, at, uh, you know, um, uh, initially that the phrase defund the police, um, turns people off relative to right. the concept of take money from the police and put it into other services and essentially shrink the police portfolio. And this is a perfect example right. of that, like you say. And, yeah. you know, and the issue like if is- Like you want, oh, sorry. Well, and the issue is, is that um, this gives you a sense of, of a dynamic that undoubtedly the odds of that kid being, end up being shot if that kid is black or higher than if he's white, that doesn't mean if the white kid doesn't get shot too on, uh, on occasion in this situation. It's just that the, the police force generally, they have this problem of perceiving force as the first sort of like answer to all of these things. They are not equipped to deal with these situations. They don't apparently uh, know how to deescalate. It is. And, and, and like, even, in the most sympathetic uh, perspective on this, and I think one that is actually like the most helpful in terms of actually getting real change is to say like, it is a lot to ask of, of police officers who are, you know, in an environment where they are perceived, you know, uh, threats everywhere to be able to turn that off. I mean, I think it should be- Exactly, I think yeah. And, 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 I and think are that, weaponed like, up. That- in such a way yep. that this is their first response. And so they should not have this responsibility. The There should be a percentage of their funds that are taken away that are commensurate with the, you know, the amount of responsibility they have in this area. And it should be given to social services and experts who, you know, that call comes into 911, the 911 uh, dispatcher says, we're going to reroute this to whatever, the, this social service. And there we're going to send people out from there. Um, and, Absolutely. and, and the fact is, is that if that kid is black, the odds of that kid being shot are not whatever the percentages were for this white kid to be shot. And obviously it can happen to the white kids too, because of the problem with the cops, but the cops have a mentality that, um, you know, that percentage wise, this black 13 year old, if it were a black 13 year old would be, uh, even, you know, perceived more likely to be a threat. Uh, than the white kid. I yes, mean, we absolutely. See and it of changes the, the entire dynamic. Yeah, it changes the entire dynamic for, especially for a mentally ill person, for a cop to show up with a gun. Like, that's an entirely different um, situation when there's like an armed officer showing up for someone that's of clearly not in a right spot. But like you said, like, I mean, it is more likely for black people. And uh, something I want to mention just um, for Utah specifically, black people make up 1% of the population. They make up 10% of all police killings that have happened. And this has been um, a big thing. Like we, the last time I spoke to you actually was when there was that uh, uh, that big protest here, and we had the All Lives Matter archer who tried to murder someone with a bow. Oh. But um, since then, like there's been, we've had, you know, daily, weekly, m- monthly, like the protests have been continuing, and throughout all this time, there's been multiple police shootings and murders, and um, I, like just recently, we were in the news again because our um, Democrat. Uh, DA in a Democrat city in a Democrat uh, county, um, he handed out a bunch of first degree felonies to people who were um, who were involved in a protest where there was paint thrown at the DA's office and on and on the street. And um, he gave first degree felonies for this, which can carry up to life in prison. So, um, I mean, this this talking point that we're hearing from from the right about these Democrat run cities and all that. I mean. 
there's going to have to be a reckoning at some point with the Democratic Party, especially at a local level, um, for what we're seeing here is that, like, they are culpable for some of the things that are happening here. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's been a chaotic few months here. But, I, I mean, this really just summed it up super well with, like, the, the problem that we're facing. And like you mentioned, I think it is a very sympathetic argument for people who might, you know, be turned off by defund the police or whatever because – that's, I mean, we can argue about the effectiveness of that, of that messaging, but like, if you care about police officers, you should probably want them to be doing less because they're being put in a lot of situations that they're just not clearly not uh, able to, to handle efficiently and effectively. And um, we get situations like this. So appreciate the call. Yeah, Kyle. That's all I got. Bye. I would only add, here's where the abolitionist movement dovetails with the movement for disability justice, because having a mental disability increases your risk of being killed by the police by many, many factors. It's not only a racial justice problem and these things, they intersect. So it is super, super important to spread awareness of this and hopefully um, we'll get a few more people on board with uh, the campaign to defund and redistribute those funds. Yeah. I mean, I think it, I think it, you know, I, I think the, the, the messaging, you know, could be massaged. I mean, I think the, you know, the, the, the country is, you know, broadly speaking, it's hard to get that message across when the word defund is there, when it really should be, you know, uh, redeploy or something, something that's more specific in that regard. I mean, well, and, defund but, is part of it. Redeploying is part of it, but it is really, really important for people to understand that the cops do not produce safety in any of these situations. And, you know, maybe the polling isn't on our side yet, but the data is certainly on our side. The data well, without, calls yeah. for defunding. That's the and that's I don't the, think the polling is against the idea of what you're talking about. I think it's just it gets misinterpreted. Like I understand that we have two different two different sort of agendas here, right? One is the uh, abolition movement, and one is the um, shrink, yeah, shrink movement, which, if which, you will. Which which can be part of the abolition movement for sure. Well, I mean, certainly from the perspective of an abolitionist, I mean, you know, the likelihood of going from the size of the police department we have now to none, I would say, is zero. Yeah, uh, and there is certainly, I think very l relatively speaking very little support of uh, to abolish the police but there is significant support to not responding to the word defund but very significant support uh to the idea to the concept that is behind the defund movement which is redeploy um resources so that police have a smaller portfolio, so that they have fewer opportunities to get into a situation where they are uh, reacting in such a violent and, and, and lethal manner. And, um, and then, you know, look, even <laughs> Grover Norquist had the concept right. I didn't agree with his perspective, but he wanted to shrink uh, government to the point where you could drown it in the bathtub. And I think, you know, the, it wasn't like uh, first he understood you need to shrink it. Um, and uh, I don't know. I, I happen to think that there is a role for police in society. I just think it has to be much more limited than it is now. I mean, I think there are communities where um, people want effective. They want police to protect and to serve. And it, unfortunately, they want safety. Yes. And the way that we have been taught to uh, understand safety is through the police. There are other ways of producing safety. And I think just because the majority of the population is not currently on board with the idea of abolition doesn't mean it's not something worth fighting for. Although it also doesn't surprise me that most of the population is not on board with abolition because you cannot abolish the police in a vacuum. And right. most people who believe in uh, abolishing police and prisons, you can't do that without also overturning capitalism and white supremacy and all of these interlocking systems. So it makes sense that it wouldn't be polling super, super well right now. And in fact, it wouldn't make sense if it was because uh, if, if socialism was put to a poll right now, that would also fail, right? But um, these are all measures that can be taken 
within um, an abolitionist framework and an abolitionist horizon. And I think just from talking to my friends who do work with No New Jails, um, with the GSA defund campaign, they do uh, the Rikers table on the weekends, they talk to people on their way to Rikers. It's not that hard to get people who are on their way to prison um, thinking about abolition and kind of kind of on board with the idea. But I do agree that the message needs to be tailored differently to different groups of people. And, and you know, and in terms of times, I mean, you know, my biggest concern is is um, that is that and and I agree that it would uh, all of what you said in terms of the way the poll. My biggest concern is that the abolition movement in terms of the you know timing will hinder the shrinkage movement that's my concern that that that's i mean that's honestly that's my genuine concern is just that um that in looking for you know in taking the maximalist position will inhibit the any reforms that could ultimately lead to the maximalist position you know, that is a valid concern. Um, however, I think I would point at some of the major victories in the shrinkage movement, which have been achieved by abolitionist groups to say that uh, that's not necessarily true. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just a question of what message is pushed. I'm not talking about the people. I mean, look, uh, you know, the um, I, I have no problem with, you know, with, with Trojan horses. Uh, the, I mean, that's, I have no problem with the Trojans coming in. It's, you know, it's just make sure that you have a horse. That's all I'm saying. No, absolutely. And I think people are thinking about this stuff every day and uh, trying to tailor their message and their organizing in a way that will be maximally effective as right. this movement picks up steam in a way that it hasn't in many years. But um uh, one book I'd recommend if you're not quite on board with the idea of abolition yet is uh, Angela Davis, Our Prisons Obsolete. I think she makes a very good argument as to why, uh, the per first of all, the historical purpose that the prison industrial complex serves in um, U.S. society, um, the things it is supposed to do, the things that it actually does. And she goes over at the end just a, a few of the alternatives um, for, for community justice. And I think that that last chapter is kind of picked up where she left off and fleshed out by other people like Mariam Kaba, who've come around since then. All right. Uh, we'll put a link to that in the, um, in the show descriptions today. Sure. Let's go to 859 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, Sam. This is Corey from Maryland. How are you? Corey from Maryland. What's on your mind? So much to, uh, Joe Rogan, uh, Sorrow, I am, I've loved playing video games since I was a kid. And recently, the next Call of Duty has announced itself. I don't know if you have noticed this one or kept track of this one. But they've announced that this one takes place during the Cold War. And <laughs> during the reveal tra trailer for this, you get, you are in a room during one of the cutscenes and you directly get orders from Ronald Reagan to protect the free world from... <laughs> from the evils that there's, that have befallen it in the 80s. Oh. And oh wait. And all I can <laughs> from the evils that I, had befallen it in the 80s or are you talking about the Soviet Union? I'm I'm well, however you want to interpret that. You are just literally given carte blanche from Reagan to go protect the free world. Okay. <laughs> so vague. Well, when well, you're when you're well, there with Reagan, maybe there's something you can do right in that moment that could help. I'm really hope I'm really hoping I can just play as Oliver North and protect the free world by uh, selling weapons to Iran. That's, that's really what I'm hoping for here. But what, what I've often, and I was just hoping to get perspective on this, but people for a while now have been talking about how games have been gotten more political. And I can't think of a game that has literally tr tried to like walk that line of, we have a message, but don't really deliver a message than Call of Duty. Because literally every single game has just been nothing but one war zone after another. Quite literally, they think they call it the more recent uh, multiplayer thing, war zone. Like quite literally. And I just want to get your thoughts on like your opinion on like when like any type of entertainment medium, whether it's in video games or in television or what have you, try to strive that that line of 
we want to deliver a political message, but we also don't want to like make like the masters in charge of all the money that are helping us do this mad yeah. with anything overtly yeah. political. I just want to get your thoughts on that. Well, I appreciate the call, Corey. Here's uh, here's Reagan. Mr. President, this is Jason Hudson and Russell. Ad- I know their names. Who do you think approved their last mission? <laughs> <laughs> is the threat real? Yes, sir, we believe it is. Can you stop Perseus? We can, sir. I've already submitted the requisition for my team. Sir, their requests are highly irregular. That Alexander Haig? illegal if the press gets mm. on. What the hell are you talking about? Do you know who we are? Every mission we go on is illegal. Sergeant Woods, plausible deniability is the backbone of our work. Al. We're talking about preventing an attack on the free men and women of the world. Give Mr. Adler whatever he wants. Gentlemen, you've been given an important task. Protecting our very way of life from a great evil. Okay, we don't need to see know. Yeah. And uh, now, now, people should know what happens after this. Um, the president leaves the room and Haig turns to all these guys and say, okay, here's the thing. He's suffering from severe dementia. <laughs> so just play along. Don't you're not going on any type of mission. This is all just part to make him feel good. Uh, we're just doing it as part of like, you know, we do this about half an hour a week just to indulge him. And that, that way he feels like he's still president. Um, I love the idea. It really reminds me of that Phil Hartman sketch on Saturday Night Live, which was hilarious because it showed ronald reagan as being competent uh secretly competent like he would yeah. be the uh the the lovable you know a sweet yep. guy and then uh the 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 little boy scout would stop taking the picture and then they would leave the room and he'd be like all right back in here and he'd just like completely super efficient ronald reagan um i think like the plausible deniability i think was uh pretty plausible let's put yeah. it that way when it came to a lot of his stuff but it would be odd. Awesome. Could could can you be one of those guys and just like take out Reagan in a weapon <laughs> <laughs> right there, just like boom, just save the free world. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I mean, look, those games—they're not apolitical. They're like advised by Pentagon people, yeah. uh, particularly those Call of Duty, the major AAA games. Those all have State Department folks all over the making of those. And I would say the reason they can't actually say true history and sort of devolve into myth and like created um stories is because if they actually did the true history they'd be the bad guys and uh so you well, can't actually convey them i mean what what we call a political very often means that it is the political perspective of the people who own the conventional wisdom mm-hmm. and have the power and that's what's called a political that's what the norm is and any dissenting view of history or the dynamic that's taking place currently is considered political. And that in and of itself is a technique in which you put people outside of the, um, the conversation. And so of course that's political, you know, of course it is, but because there's the, you know, it's just sort of this mainstream thing that any, any, you know, like look Gamergate, Right. Like the idea that uh, the only women who appeared in, in video games were essentially like, you know, uh, street walking prostitutes. Uh, nothing wrong with that, but that's a limited perspective on uh, women's roles in the context of, you know, they're there to service the hero, essentially. Um, well, don't forget, there's Laura Croft Tomb Raider. Right. Well, she uh, she really leaned into having enormous tits. <laughs> But I, but I think this was the, the this was the big fight with Gamergate was that just this perspective of like hey maybe we shouldn't be you know we shouldn't uh, traffic in these type of sort of like broad uh, generalizations or limited perspectives. Was, um, it was, was about that. ethics in video games journalism. Sorry mm-hmm. to interrupt, but I need mm-hmm. to correct you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I've no. I've been told that. I've been. I've definitely been told that. I think specifically, I've been told that. <laughs> um, on the IMs, uh, good morning, comrade, former cop here. I'm actually fine with shrinking the police down to only SWAT teams, but they would be activated so rarely that you would most likely never see them in your lifetime. 
that would be great. Uh, Sam, has no one filed a bar association against uh, bar uh, yet? I don't believe so. There's one thing I want to go back to on this DOJ story. Um, the way this DOJ representing Trump story is being presented is also highly problematic. And this gives you a notion of like how quickly things are going to snap back once Donald Trump is gone. Put up this, uh, this tweet or these two different graphics. Um, we mentioned that Barr is represented, has decided the DOJ is taking over for Donald Trump's personal lawyers, arguing in effect that because he works for a federal agency, I don't know what that federal agency would be, the presidency is not a federal agency, and because he denied that he ever knew this woman who has accused him of a rape, that that, hit, that denial was in the furtherance of his job is absurd. But the DOJ is going to take it over anyways. So here it is. Look, a Justice Department intervenes to help Trump in a Gene Carroll defamation lawsuit. The government lawyers made the unusual move of seeking to take over President Trump's defense in a suit brought by Ms. Carroll, who has accused Trump of raping her in the 1990s. Well, it's not just an unusual move. It, it, it's unprecedented. DOJ is not supposed to be uh, the president's personal lawyers. He was not acting in any capacity in any way that you could define that. And now look at how it was reported when Bill Clinton, not a government official, obviously married to uh, Hillary Clinton, who was at the time also not a government official, but uh, the DOJ was, I think, looking into uh, the email situation. Look what happened when... Um, he ran into her on a uh, um, the tarmac on her plane. Meeting between Bill Clinton and Loretta Lynch provokes a political furor. Is there not a political furor over the the president being defended by the DOJ in a defamation suit? Clinton has wild into a political storm with Republicans asserting that it compromised the Justice Department's politically sensitive investigation into Hillary Clinton. I mean, just the perspective here, um, the New York Times is constantly trying to show their bona fides that they're, that they're you know, impartial in some way. And invariably, um, they, the way that they, their entire perspective on these things is dramatically different, even though they are equivalent in terms of being problematic. Um, well, is it possible that the Republicans made a much bigger deal over the Clinton thing than Democrats are making over the Trump thing? Absolutely. Because then, Absolutely. you know, they're just reporting on the level of the Fuhrer. Well, I guess so. But I mean, the, you know, um, an unusual move downplays what this is. It's unprecedented. And it is, there are some objective issues here right? There are some objective assessments that you can make. If you're a news organization, it should not be just a function of whoever yells the loudest gets to own the territory of reality in terms of the relationship between these things. I mean, I think that's, th I think that's what they would say. I mean, I think that's their excuse. Is that like, well, look, Democrats aren't making a big deal of this. Well, but the newspaper's not, I mean, the news is not supposed to be just about taking reaction shots. I agree with you. The Democrats need to make a bigger deal of these issues for it to resonate. They need to do some, you know, politicking as well. But there is a concept that the DOJ is distinct in terms of uh, that they are the the lawyers for the country, not for the president. And that concept exists regardless of if you have a feckless Democratic Party that doesn't uh, capitalize on, on these things. And regardless of if you have an overzealous Republican Party that overcapitalizes on these things. I mean, there that's the whole point of the news media that is ostensibly, and we're not like that. Like we're, we're, we are, we are, we have a point of view that we are, you know, that when we talk about the news, that we openly um that 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 is front and forward i mean we we have we are perspective journalists
we're coming from a specific perspective and ideology that we make clear. But the Times poses as if they're not. And it's not enough for them to say there are only two opinions here, two institutions that represent, and, and to the extent that they are good at manipulating uh, a response is the definition of what reality is. That, that can't, that is why we have the situation that we have. And, you know, there's been moments where Donald Trump has driven them out of that box. But you can see how still, even after four years of this, how the, there is such a compulsion to get back into that box and talk about things specifically as, um, they, as performative. And there is a relationship between the DOJ and the presidency that has existed in this country that is not, that should not be solely a function of how well people complain about it. And, 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 but I mean, that's exactly their, the attitude. I mean, you've captured it exactly. That's exactly their attitude. And that is exactly, you know, part of the problem. Yep. Makes them super easy to manipulate. And they're afraid of showing their liberal bias constantly. So it makes them biased in the other direction, ironically that, enough. That's exactly right. That's a hundred percent right. In fact, maybe, you know, we'll, what we, we, uh, if we do some, uh, deep archive, uh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. I want to say Massey or something, but um, we had someone on from the Columbia Journalism Review very early in the first like four or five months of when Janine and I were doing the majority report. And he, he introduced us to this concept. Now this is pre, you know, email was very new. So it was really about letters. And he would talk about like journalists getting 3000 letters hey. uh, on a, uh, a topic and it would change their they would feel defensiveness about their liberalism and they would change their coverage to basically cover themselves from ac such accusations. And um, that was, uh, you know, I remember that interview vividly because it was 15 years ago, but it, 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 it so vividly, I can't remember his name right now, but, um, but it, fundamentally um, defined part of our project on that show, which was to use the radio as a way of, you know, fighting back against, you know, all those uh, folks sitting in the church basements, you know, filling out these form letters essentially to uh, change coverage of whatever it was. Okay. Going to the IM's wild card two, six. Hi, Matt. I've been playing MS flight simulator since the Commodore 64 days. Matt doesn't know what that is. I do. Do you know what a Commodore 64 is, Matt? Just like an old ancient video gaming system. Yeah, I mean, it was really more almost like a, almost like a, like, maybe a computer, I guess. I, I mean, to call it a computer is almost like, I mean, it, it was a computer, but. Um, I was going to guess it was a plane. No. <laughs> I hereby challenge you to a guns only dogfight in the plane of your choice. I play on DCS, World of Warplanes and many other hosted systems. Do you accept my challenge? Uh, I'm going to have to get back to me on that. I I'm unfamiliar with some of those systems. Jonathan okay. Armstead. Fight Sam, in great shout out to the Jeffersons. Out of curiosity, had you ever heard a white person referred to as a honky before you saw that show? I've long thought they popularized it for mainstream audiences. Gosh, I don't remember. I mean, I, I imagine that was the first time I heard a white person referred to that, although... Richard Pryor uh, said it too, didn't he? Wouldn't yeah, he I can't, oh, I, yeah, I can't. I can't. I mean, I can't. And I had some. I I had a couple of friends in elementary school, and in high. You know, I'm trying to think what the timing was for the Jeffersons, where we would do. I think I don't know if we even called it snaps at that time, but so and it's possible that I had heard it before then, but. Um, it's a very 60s and 70s kind of word. It was very 70s. Rabbit from Boston. Hey, MR crew, uh, just became a, a member over this past weekend after learning during last week's show that the slogan left is best was popularized in my hometown of West Hartford. Hmm. Oh, well, there you go. Hi. 
it was the last sign from the universe I needed to finally support the show. I've been listening daily since lockdown. Shout out to Jamie and all the Connecticut commies. Rest in power, Michael. Indeed. You know, I went to school in New London. I served. I served. I worked at the Connecticut State uh, Assembly for uh, huh. a year or maybe a semester. I can't remember. Huh. Huh. I dated somebody from West Hartford, too. Oh, my God. Um, I used to go to punk shows in New London, but that was probably at the LNG. I went to many of those shows. Oh my God. I didn't realize the LNG was around that much longer, but yeah, it must've been around for a super long time. If you and I both went there, it definitely was. Uh, do you think these Woodward tapes are, are legit going to hurt Trump? These get hyped up all the time and he's seemingly immune to it. I think he has a lot of weakness on COVID and um, I do. I think it's going to hurt him in the sense that, like, he's going to resign. No, but is it is it going to like um, a series of things like this for the next sixty days? Would um, it just eats up? It eats up uh, time, where you know he's not he's not getting a de- uh, he's on the defensive, and that's that's a good thing. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know how you would qualify that, but I can just say like, I wouldn't get, you know, I wouldn't invest too much in any one thing. Uh, Foresto, I'd like to add to the call of duty caller that Activision regularly says their games are not political in official press releases. We just had a controversy over a major female game character having decent sized muscles. Unfortunately, Gamergate is alive and well, there you go. Uh, traffic cone. If you mentally think no me key. When saying Nomiki's name, you'll get the pronunciation right every time. But even when I said Nomiki, and then I said Nomiki, like I, I, it's just, I hit the wrong vowel every time. And then I remember that I hit the wrong vowel and then I can't remember what the right vowel is. Nomiki. I think we all just need to accept your pronunciation and move on. Honestly. It's, uh, she's not the only one whose name you uh, mispronounced, so... That's right. Thank you, Yami. <laughs> Lefty Lib, communist and libertarian truce. Matt should play the cruiser Aurora on the world of warships on Twitch. Took part in the revenue, uh, the the rev of oh, the revolution of 1917. Much love. Jay Rude. Hey, Sam, thanks to you and the crew. I've been listening for a while and have turned most of my family into MR fans. Oh, well, welcome fa- family of Jay Rude. Finally became a member a few weeks ago. Keep up the great work in these terrible times. Thank you. Um, yeah, let's have some fun here's dave rubin um uh, on uh sean hank they've been putting them all over fox news lately you know is that this is actually wow. sean hannity on the rubin report oh really oh, okay um Th- that sounds more realistic yeah there you go um so here is uh this is from um who cinco sanders and it's sort of embarrassing for, for Dave Rubin. And that's why I was hesitating. Like, do we really want to play something that embarrasses Dave Rubin? And then I was like, of course we do. I'm joking. Of course we do. So, but I, I want to live my life giving a flying rip what some idiot keyboard wa- warrior in their underwear in their parents' basement at 60 years old cares uh, about Pause me or says second. about me. Pause anonymous- for a second. Incidentally, for those of you who are under the age of 60, um, what Sean is talking about is the um, insult that people would lob at bloggers 15 to 20 years ago. So Sean has not exactly kept up with the times. Um, the idea- Well, no, of- he adjusted the age of the person. Now they're 60. <laughs> <laughs> Living in their 90-year-old That's parents' true. basement. And their parents, their parents are in their 90s. Uh, and, uh, so there you go. All right. So let's start, uh, uh, at the beginning. Oh, incidentally. Okay. Go ahead. So, but I don't want to live my life giving a flying rip what some idiot keyboard wa- warrior in their underwear in their parents' basement at 60 years old cares uh, about me or says about me anonymously on some social media site. That's why I have no access to any of it. I don't ever read it. You just handed us the clip. That's the promo clip. I mean, that was tailor-made promo clip right there, the guy in his underwear. 
Not this, me, this, the this, keyboard this, warriors this, that are psycho. Oh, oh not you. Ah, no, okay. not Hannity. Um, Hannity's this, not in his basement in his underwear anonymously typing out, I hate Hannity. That's not me. Oh, all right. Well, they'll, they'll still come after you for it. Um, Probably. Uh, does, does the grind... <laughs> so wait a second. Who didn't understand wh- who was talking about there? They both, they both, like, that's the... Ruben thought that he would get the clip of... Um, and Sean Hannity had a lot of qualifiers, didn't he? Yeah. Like, like he, he's not going to care about you if you're over the age of 60, living in your parents' basement, in your underwear, anonymous on the internet, on one of these social media platforms. That's not a huge cohort of people. I think I would be. I, to- I would be afraid of those people if, if they existed, if such a cohort existed. That's very specific. That's very specific, but he he gives a flying rip about just about everybody else. I mean, I know how insecure this guy is. He used to beg Janine to come on the show. It was embarrassing. (laughs) And uh, because he desperately thought that this would help him with women because his numbers with women have always been bad Um, because he sort of comes off as a little bit creepy. And, um, and I think that's, you know, I think that's part of it, but, it's weird that he's only doesn't care about such a narrow set of people. Yeah, it's almost like he's thinking of like one guy who's been his nemesis for like the past 40 years. That's who he super doesn't care about. I'm not going to give a rip about what Kevin Shaughnessy says about me online. I, I mean, did I say his name? I wasn't, I didn't mean to. That guy, what a jerk. I like, well, let's go back and watch Dave Rubin turn red when he realizes that like Rubin tries to make some type of joke and Hannity's too dumb to get it. And then Rubin, you can see him almost turn crimson immediately. This is a little bit embarrassing. Let's just take it right, right. Yeah. Like right about where a little bit like, I don't know, ever read it. You to just joke. handed us the clip. That's the promo clip. I mean, that was Taylor, Taylor made promo clip right there. The guy in his underwear. Not me, the keyboard warriors that are psycho. Oh, oh, not you. Ah, No, not Hannity. Um, Hannity's not in his basement in his underwear anonymously typing out, I hate Hannity. That's not me. Oh, all right. Well, they'll they'll still come after you for it. Um, Probably. uh, Does the grind... Come after you for what? I don't get it. Hannity's the one in his basement, and it sounds like he's actually doing that from his basement. Uh, Hannity's the one in his basement saying that Hannity's great anonymously. Is there any doubt that that guy has sock puppets? Oh, of course. But I think in this instance, Dave Rubin actually did perceive accurately what he was trying to say. But Hannity, uh, for some reason, I don't know, thought that he was being accused of being that guy. Yes. Perhaps uh, because he is him. I don't know. And that's what triggered his. Oh, I'm not talking about me which he didn't actually need to say. I think that's right. Ruben thought like, okay, the way that we'll promo this clip is he'll say, I'm not going to care about some guy in his basement with his, you know, wearing his underwear. And Henny said, oh, I I don't do that. That's not, no, no, I'm not. (laughs) I don't have a sock puppet named, uh, you know, Brendan O'Malley that uh, does that. I don't, where'd you get that idea? Wrong, Dave, (laughs) not me. I wonder if that's that that's actually that's the the real story. Mm. Hannity's not in his basement in his underwear. In a sock puppet, giving him compliments. <laughs> I wonder if he like goes down there. I wonder if Hannity goes down into his basement in his underwear, gets on some type of social media platform, talks about how great Hannity is, and then shows uh, his his new girlfriend, An- Ainsley Answer. Like look at look at how people really re- responded well to my my segment tonight on how uh, SJWs are ruining America or something. God, that's right. They're together now. Yep. That's disgusting. I mean, for whom? For everybody who has to know about it. Society. Uh, Crenshaw. <laughs> Crenshaw's third eye. For 1 million subscribers, can we please have the diabetic cats on stream? The, I mean, it's a cat. He's super cute. But, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I've gotten very comfortable with giving shots now. 
Mint's down. That's like, good. Yeah. Matt showed his cat to the people the other day. Well, I'm not doing it. I'm not. Uh, I don't bring the. I don't bring the cat over here. But maybe I'll take a picture. Maybe I'll show a picture. <laughs> um, great leap forward. It's nighttime here in the Bay Area, California. It's actually 11 a.m. It's apocalyptic. Literally, the birds have stopped singing. Oy. Uh Hub Dub. I think that abolition will be used as a scary message by the right, no matter what the messaging is for reform or shrinking budgets. There could be no talk of abolition and they will create it. I, I think that's true. I just don't think it will resonate in the same um uh in the in the same way. I mean, I I, I think like, you know, there we're seeing it, uh, you know, take place in cities around the country, I mean, you know, small cities, bigger cities where they're shrinking the, the, the police budget. And we've seen the polling where people respond to it positively because it's quite obvious. It's a quite obvious need. And um, there's no doubt they're going to say that, but just the fact that they're going to say that anyways doesn't mean that it's going to have the same level of efficacy. Well, on the other hand, think about it this way. Most people in this country learn about the abolitionist movement in history, the movement to abolish chattel slavery, right? So we think of that as a good thing. And there is a historical connection there between uh, finishing the work of reconstruction especially undoing the rollbacks of civil rights, which were passed immediately after Reconstruction failed, and what we're talking about now with defunding the police. So that's a catchy slogan. But I mean, no, I, I look, I'm just going by what the polling, you know, what the what the research has, has shown. Uh, I, I actually think that, like, you know, I, I think it's, it, you know, the, I don't know, my sense is like even, Reconstruction. I would say, you know, I, I would say Reconstruction is the most woefully un uh like the lack of awareness of reconstruction in this country, I think is enormous. Like I would say I I wouldn't be surprised if sixty to seventy percent of the population wouldn't even know what you're talking about when you said the word reconstruction. Yeah. That's think, a huge problem. I don't think I ever heard that word in high school. Really? I don't think so. I mean, I think it's probably changed now, but you know, and I went to high school 40 years ago, but yeah. Um, it wasn't until I was in college and read Phoner that I like actually had the idea of, Oh, reconstruction, this discreet, you know, moment in time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, 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 it has been, I, I think that is like, if you want to talk about the one of the most important the the one of the most damaging projects i think of the of the right in this country um and maybe it's a broader project than that then like the the failure to teach about reconstruction um i think is enormous because as soon as you learn about reconstruction the 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 it, the thing that it teaches you in my mind is like a it expands your imagination as to what can be b it, it immediately begs the question of like what happened <laughs> like wait a second uh and it also tells you like this is not this is you know th there's this is not new like what we're going through is like we never you know this isn't a question of like that was a long time ago like we're still in on some level that period of time in many respects in terms of like not quite there you know um it's pretty it's 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 pretty stunning yeah yep and it also uh fuels the connection with abolitionism today because as angela davis goes over in her book that i already plugged once and i'm gonna plug it again because i really like it uh the 13th Amendment has had an asterisk, right? Slavery was abolished, except for as a punishment for someone who's been convicted as a crime. And then what did they do? They passed a bunch of crappy laws. They passed the Black Codes, basically meant to criminalize 
black people for any reason whatsoever and send them to jail and oh whoops you're a slave again yep um speaking of history uh don trump is um looking to both compare himself to historical figures and rewrite recent history um the one thing that the trump administration not the one thing one of the things the trump administration has done with incredible efficacy has been to completely shatter our regulatory state when it comes to protecting the environment and here's donald trump sort of hinting at maybe the opposite as president i'll defend our environment i'll defend our workers and our cherished way of life Last month, I signed the Great American Outdoors Act, the most significant investment in our national parks in over a century since Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt. You know, they came to my office, a lot of the senators that I just introduced, and Ron and everybody, they came to my office. They said that this will make us and make you the number one environmental president since Teddy Roosevelt. I said, Huh, that sounds good, because I wasn't going to do it. I figured, you know, let's not do it. But when they said that, that was like a challenge. <laughs> so I said, well, why does it only have to go back to Teddy Roosevelt, which is over 100 years? Why can't we say from George Washington, right from the beginning? They said, well, we're not quite there yet, but one other bill like this will be there, Lindsay. You know that, right? But it's true. Number one since Teddy Roosevelt. Who would have thought Trump is the great environmentalist? You hear that? Do you hear that? Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, first of all, you know he's making that up, right? They didn't say that to him. But even if they did, they're lying. Um, they are conserving that act, which did get bipartisan support. Um, it it basically conserves some of our uh, our uh, national parks. Um, but, and largely, you know, it is also a big part of like the economy for these Western, uh, states, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look down his environmental, you know, cafe standards, clean water act, um, the amount of mercury that we put into the air, uh, rolling back, um, uh, light bulb efficiencies, rolling back, um, uh, you know, plumbing efficiencies, rolling back, uh, you know, where you can put sludge, you know, heavy metals and dump them into the water. The Paris Climate Accords, um, the uh, Anwar drilling, uh, I mean, the, the Keystone Pipeline, the, the list goes on and on. Offshore drilling, there is almost no, they they allow for um, more poisonous toxins that can hurt the uh, neural development of babies. Um, yeah, but think about how great it's going to be for the environment when they open up Six Flags Grand Canyon, Sam. There you go. People are going to enjoy it more like Teddy Roosevelt wanted. Um it's pretty stunning. They have been very effective at this. This is what they're, you know, they're good at because it's, it's so it's narrow, right? Like, it's just like what all they got to do is say, what do you want business? Like what's costing you money? What compliance so that you're not offloading the expenses of your profit onto uh, American people or uh, frankly, any people. Um, what, what is, where could you increase your profit by not having to, uh, which externalities can we absorb for you as a society? And they get the list and then they just do it. It's the easiest thing in the world for them. Just like Teddy Roosevelt would have wanted. Well, I not can't wait. Judge. I can't wait to view the Grand Canyon from the roller coaster that they're going to put in the middle of it. It's amazing. I, like I had no interest in this until you said I could be number one going back to Teddy Roosevelt. I wasn't. I didn't care to be honest. I was going to go to lunch, but then you're like, "Oh, I could be number one in it." Number one. And, well, okay, then I'll sign it. Yeah, I mean, sometimes he tells the truth. <laughs> uh so some not great news, but not necessarily. I don't know. I, I, I this news sort of cuts both ways in my mind. Um. Astra, Astra 
Zeneca, which is uh, was developing one of the uh, which is developing one of the vaccines, has paused its global phase three COVID nineteen vaccine trial uh, because a um, British participant fell seriously ill, and they're they're examining what it's a function of. Could be something else, but. The upshot is that, at least in this instance, AstraZeneca is not pushing the thing through without sort of stopping if there's a problem, right? Which is a legitimate concern based upon Donald Trump's uh, timeline. I don't care if it's safe. We'll give it to uh, we'll give it to Barron, and if he <laughs> if he can handle it, we'll do it. But here is uh, Anthony Fauci saying that um, probably not realistic to expect a vaccine by the end of uh, by November, but maybe by the end of 2020. I mean, look, the bottom line is you need some time to find out if it's effective. You can't just give someone a vaccine and say, oh, they didn't die. So they won't die next week or they won't get sick next week or in a month. And uh, who knows if it's going to last more than, I don't know, three hours, just boom. But here's a, uh, Here's Fauci on with uh, Judy Woodruff on C-SPAN. That we're going to have a vaccine by November 3rd. How realistic? Well, I think that's unlikely. I mean, the only way you can see that scenario come true is if that there are so many infections in the clinical trial sites that you get a efficacy answer sooner than you would have projected. Like I said, it's not impossible, Judy, but it's unlikely that we'll have a definitive answer at that time, more likely by the end of the year. Even then, I would be surprised, frankly, but um, that's encouraging. The other thing, I mean, I just want to, you know, some good news is that, you know, we supposedly we're going to, we're a month or two away from um, a uh, almost an instant test five bucks a pop that you can, uh, you can take a test. I don't know if it's going to be how accurate it's going to be, but I mean, at $5 a pop, you, it's, you know, you can take three and get a sense, right? I mean, 70% accurate, 80% accurate, take three right after, right out, you know, 15 bucks, boom, that would be not a, a bad situation. So, um, there's some hope folks. It's just going to be a couple of rough uh, months before then. I thought it was interesting, too, with um, the letter that all of these uh, pharmaceutical companies joined together to write to say that we are going to take this seriously and we'll be above board with how we create our vaccine <laughs> in the because of Trump's insistence that they make it as quickly as possible. I mean, I maybe am a little cynical because I think uh, these uh, pharmaceutical companies, you know, chase profits over anything mm -hmm. else. Uh, but I suspect that's more of like a marketing thing. Sure. Like they sat around uh, their boardrooms and said, hey, we've got a uh, trust issue. What can we do? How about a pledge? That sounds good. Somebody write that up. I'll sign it. I mean, I don't know. I don't, I mean, I'm not prepared to be first in line. Let's put it that way. Mm -mm. Uh, I'm going to, this is, what do they call it? The second mover advantage? Yeah, uh, that's me in this instance. Mm. Um, but I will, uh, but Brendan, if you want to go first, and then we'll we'll watch for a couple of weeks and see what happens. We'll see about that. They should just test it in Florida. Florida's yeah. crawling with COVID. They should. Um, all right, let's just do this uh, Zuckerberg thing. Zuckerberg's got a problem because he's starting to realize that uh, Donald Trump may not be in office in, uh, in four or five months. And um, there's a lot of hostility out there towards Facebook from various sectors. And I think to a certain extent that I don't think Mark Zuckerberg has any, um, any partisan politics. Let's put it that way. I think his politics are whatever, um, allows him to accrue as much wealth as possible uh, is what he's in favor of. And, um, 
and anything that he can do that will further that goal, that's the only thing he cares about. And here he is explaining to Mike Allen on Axios HBO that um, Facebook is not dominated by right-wing media. And, um, and then we're going to show some, some examples of what it might be dominated by. Every indication is that the Facebook platform is helping President Trump win again. Certainly his team will tell you that. It's not about intent, like it's how they use the product. What do you make of the way President Trump and the Republicans have mastered Facebook? Well, I, I actually think, you know, across the spectrum, I don't think this is a Democrat or a Republican thing. I think some people are more sophisticated and just authentic or natural um, on the internet and social media than than others. Um, but, you know, overall, I, I do think that social media um, allows everyone to have a voice, including people who might have not um, traditionally been able to get their message out through a lot of the traditional media. And, you know, that's, that's not a necessarily a partisan point. So you're right that it's not partisan. President Obama very effectively le leveraged Facebook for two elections. But now that's flipped. And Facebook, the reality is, is a real right-wing echo chamber. If you look at some of the loudest voices on Facebook, it's your Breitbart and it's Sarah Palin and it's Franklin Graham. And that part of the spectrum has figured out Facebook in this moment. Your liberal friends must hate it. Well, well look, I, I think your characterization, frankly, is, is uh, just wrong. I, I don't think that the service is, um, is, is a right-wing echo chamber, to, to use your words. Um, I, I think that um, you know, everyone can use their voice and can find um, media that they trust, that, that reflects the opinions um, and the, the life experiences that they're having. Some people, I think, had found before that, um, that their experiences weren't being covered by traditional media and now um, are, are able to, to find voices and, and follow them um, that resonate more with their life experience. Um, I, I, it's not clear to me that that's a bad thing. Um, but, but look, I mean, the, the stories that get the most reach, right, the, on a day-to-day -day basis are the same things that people talk about in, in, in the mainstream. They're not um, highly partisan political issues. It's um, just meaningful news that's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, the um, first off, buy a tripod for your, uh, for your webcam. Did you notice that they had it, uh, Axios, they had it like on, on a, a stack of books in between. Did you notice that when it panned over? I think that's probably just done to make them look charming in some way. Um, here is a, uh, an image of Facebook's top 10 performing link posts by us Facebook pages in the last 24 hours. Who put this up? This is Facebook, uh, putting up their own thing. That was uh, from when was that? It was from, uh, uh, was that yesterday? Today. Fox News. And incidentally, I just want to remind you of the words that Zuckerberg used to explain why we have, why some things rise to the part, this top. Uh, keep, the, keep it up there because I'll reiterate it because I have it. He says, those voices that are most authentic or natural or can't get their message through traditional media. So Fox News apparently can't get their message through traditional media, even though they are traditional media. They're the most authentic and natural voices. Donald Trump, again, can't get his message through the traditional media. Yeah, never read about that guy. Authentic or natural. Ben Shapiro, authentic, natural. This guy is a complete natural when it comes to social media. It has nothing to do with the millions of dollars that he spends on advertising that are pumped in. Presumably it comes from him, but who knows? Dan Bongino, so natural, so authentic. Can't get his message through traditional media. I mean, have you ever turned on Fox and not seen Dan Bongino? Blue Lives Matter. It's the uh, police. Fox News again. Ben Shapiro again. Sean Hannity, who can't get his... 
uh, message through traditional media because radio and television barely reach anybody between those two platforms. Franklin Graham, of course, the most popular Christian in the country, I guess. I don't know if he's the most popular. Uh, and Dan Bongino again. Here is um, Kevin Ruse, who wrote this story in the New York Times about um, a top performing post on Facebook, a QAnon story about uh, Save the Children. Here it is. Uh, this, uh, put that uh, image up, will you? Number 12. The most shared uh, post by a U.S. Facebook page in the last 24 hours is Save the Children post by the QAnon following Fairbanks, Alaska-based rapper Static G. Oh, my God. Three million on uh, Facebook hitting the mainstream media. Pedo rings have been busted all over America and the world. That's what exposure works. It does. I mean, are you serious? Like, all of this is all just sort of fantastical. Um, to you, maybe. Well, the bottom line is, this is the this is how a um, big company like this uh, avoids regulatory um, reg avoids regulation and avoids uh, political pushback. You kowtow to those in power, and Donald Trump is certainly not going to uh, pursue any regulation of Facebook because oh. they're doing exactly what they want. Yeah, not as long as those are the top 10 posts on it. That's right. It'll be interesting to see what happens when Joe Biden's in office. Facebook is bad, folks. Facebook is bad yeah. regardless of what those top 10 posts are. Oh, for sure. Um, Matt Binder, I think it was Matt Binder, also made a pretty good point the other day, which is like, you know, they're, they're removing uh, pages associated with uh, Antifa now as a way of trying to be balanced because they I guess they've kicked off some of the craziest right wingers. But like people's interaction with Antifa on Facebook is absolutely not the same. Like you got a mush brain boomer coming across a post, save the children, that they have no framework with which to evaluate the claims made in it. Like how many anti-fascist posts is that true of? And how many anti-fascist pages are mainly frequented by people who already know quite a bit about anti-fascism and went there on purpose? Right, right. It's a fundamentally different product that they're putting out essentially. Mm -hmm. All right, final call of the day. Call from a 504 area code. I'm sorry, we have a lot of people holding. Just can't get to y'all. Sorry. Oh, hello? I, hello, who's this? Hey, this is Jeff from just outside of New Orleans. Jeff, outside of New Orleans, uh, you may not be the last call to the, the day because your phone is not very good. What's on your mind? Is that better? Oh, yes, that is better. I don't know what you just did, but I can tell you, don't do the other thing because nobody will talk to you yeah. anymore. I did some, did some tech stuff. Well, so how's it going, folks? I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, schools opening up uh, down in, in um, Jefferson Parish, Orleans, uh, right outside of Orleans is where I live. And they opened up our schools uh, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. And it was really interesting to me that the literally the day after – they opened the schools in Jefferson Parish. They appealed to the governor, like the, the parish council, uh, literally passed a resolution, just like basically telling the governor, John Bell Edwards, who's sort of a conservative Democrat, to uh, move all of uh, this, essentially move the state, or at least this parish, to phase three, uh, when in, in Jefferson Parish has the highest number of cases of COVID in the state of Louisiana, which is also the number one per capita state uh, for cases of COVID. And it's just this sort of like rush to either get things, you know, quote unquote, back to normal or to, um, you know, get the economy open or whatever these sort of like right wing canards are, uh, are really taking over. I mean, really being put in front of uh, the lives of, of people, you know, the kids and the teachers in school. And I've, I've myself have been in a situation where, um, I can't even, I've been having to take sick days and have applied for leave right. uh, because my wife uh, and my mother-in-law are both um, immunocompromised and, and my, wife, my wife has asthma. So if they get COVID, it's a, it's a horrible situation. So I just wanted to kind of like flag that. And, and I know that's happening now uh, since after Labor Day all across the country. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, it, it's, 
it's really problematic. I mean, the only places where I think there should be any question of, of in-person schooling is more or less in the Northeast, where the rate of infection is, the community spread is, is low enough uh, that in, 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 you know, if done smartly can be uh, safe. Now, with that said, it's sadly not being done terribly smartly uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, around these parts, but uh, appreciate the call. Yeah. Hang, hang in there. Can I give a plug real quick? Of course. Uh, so I am the host, uh, along with my friend Robert, who's on the IMs, of a show called Good Morning Comrade uh, on WHIV huh. in New Orleans. You can also get more information about our show uh, at goodmorningcomrade.com. Uh, our last interview was with Rebecca Dorelli and Anne Marie Coviello, uh, who are two educators. One is from uh, Arizona and is an organizer with uh, National Educators United. Uh, the other one is, is here with me. Uh, and we're both with Louisiana Educators United, and we're trying to get educators, you know, up, active, and moving, uh, and and get our unions on side so that we can actually start fighting against a lot of this stuff. Uh, are you on in the mornings every morning? Uh, the show comes on Tuesdays at eight o'clock, and we also have a podcast um, that that goes out. Uh, just check out GoodMorningComrade.com. Uh, you, t- you should touch base with. Uh, do you follow uh, Ronald Reagan on uh, Twitter? Uh, I believe so. I'll have to look, uh, and just sort of like, like hunt him down. What's that again? Y- y- Yakima Abrogado, I think it is. And, oh, I can spell that. <laughs> um, and, uh, touch base with him because, um, he and a couple other folks are, you know, are, are sort of like, uh, collecting shows and just making mm-hmm. notes of it. And we're going to try and maybe, you know, provide some support, you know, uh, for, for shows around the country like yours. Oh, that's wonderful. Th- uh, thanks for the tip. Have a great day. Appreciate you taking the call. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, folks, that's it for our uh, call-in portion of our program today. That noise uh, sa- signifies that. We'll read four or five IMs and get out of here. June uh, unreluctantly. June unreluctantly. I don't need Jamie, Jamie Peck to woman-splain shrinkage to me. Good morning, comrade. Hey, y'all, sending this from my mom's basement. Just wanted to say this. Hannity sucks. Uh, Jay Tingle, gamers went apeshit when the last Tomb Raider movie was cast with Alicia Vindicander as Laura Croft. There was great indignation at the choice given the Swedish actor's lack of Zaftig features. Hmm. In the last Call of Duty campaign, there's a mission that depicts the highway of death in Iraq, where America bombed retreating forces fleeing Kuwait, but the game changes the perpetrator of the war crimes from the U.S. to Russia. Jeez. Ann Morrison, I would like to recommend the new podcast, A World to Win, by Grace Blakely, a British economics and uh, politics commentator, columnist, journalist, author, as a calm, mature global outlook that Americans, Jamie especially, could benefit listening to. Uh, All right. I am aware of Grace Blakely. I like her very much. And it would be really cool even to have her on this show. She's so smart. All right. We'll look into that. Brendan, will you put that down? Simple socialist on the call of duty thing. Last game dabbled with historical revisionism by changing the perpetrator of the desert storm highway of death from from U.S. to Russia. Interesting. SNL, Chevy Chase, Richard Pryor, word association, honky honky. That's true. I heard that early too. I can't remember if I... If I saw the Jeffersons before that, I mean, that was 75, 76. And I certainly saw that in real time. Um, But all right, three more. Uh, Melancholy. I don't know if uh, he was the person you interviewed. Jay Rosen's big on the journalist and bias. No, it wasn't. It was uh, Robert Massey. I think it was. I ran to the push the right to appear objective when I was a reporter. Many, one of the many reasons I left newspapers. Commodore was my first personal computer. My boyfriend, now husband, kept his in his dorm room closet on our first date. He asked me if he wanted, if I wanted to play on his computer. You can see why I married him, huh? <laughs> Jay Chivone. Uh, Mike Allen is a hoarder. Gawker ran photos of his office, and there's zero question he's severely disordered. He's a good match for Zuckerberg. Upon reflection, it was 1982 when I saw the Revios at LNG. I dined at the hygienic restaurant before the show. 82 was a couple of years before I was at, uh, in New London. 81 was not years before either of you were born. That was, uh, 82 was two years before I was at college there. Venture, you can do the math. Venture pessimist. I need Ronald Reagan's approval to do some war crimes. 
Um, Colorado's car carpet center. eBay competes on prices with Amazon. It is a great alternative. eBay pretty much has everything. Shout out to Mindy. And the final I am of the day. Don, Jamie, try backing off your mic when you speak. All right. <laughs> See you. Oh, uh, tomorrow, uh, the whole gang will be here with uh, old Matt. And uh, I'll be back Friday with Shahid Buttar. Check it out. See you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know Yeah.